Second Memoir. A Letter to M. Blanky. Paris, April 1, 1841. Monsieur. Before resuming my inquiries into government and property, it is fitting, for the satisfaction of some worthy people, and also in the interest of order, that I should make to you a plain, straightforward explanation. In a much governed state, no one would be allowed to attack the external form of the society, and the groundwork of its institutions, until he had established his right to do so, first, by his morality, second, by his capacity, and, third, by the purity of his intentions. Anyone who, wishing to publish a treatise upon the constitution of the country, could not satisfy this threefold condition, would be obliged to procure the endorsement of a responsible patron possessing the requisite qualifications. But we Frenchmen have the liberty of the press. This grand right, the sort of thought, which elevates the virtuous citizen to the rank of legislator, and makes the malicious citizen an agent of discord, frees us from all preliminary responsibility to the law. But it does not release us from our internal obligation to render a public account of our sentiments and thoughts. I have used, in all its fullness, and concerning an important question, the right which the Charter grants us. I come today, sir, to submit my conscience to your judgment, and my feeble insight to your discriminating reason. You have criticized in a kindly spirit, I had almost said with partiality for the writer, a work which teaches a doctrine that you thought it your duty to condemn. The Academy of Moral and Political Sciences, said you in your report, can accept the conclusions of the author only as far as it likes. I venture to hope, sir, that, after you have read this letter, if your prudence still restrains you, your fairness will induce you to do me justice. Men, equal in the dignity of their persons and equal before the law, should be equal in their conditions, such is the thesis which I maintained and developed in a memoir bearing the title, What is Property? Or, An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government. The idea of social equality, even in individual fortunes, has in all ages besieged, like a vague presentiment, the human imagination. Poets have sung of it in their hymns. Philosophers have dreamed of it in their utopias, priests teach it, but only for the spiritual world. The people, governed by it, never have had faith in it. And the civil power is never more disturbed than by the fables of the age of gold and the reign of Astria. A year ago, however, this idea received a scientific demonstration, which has not yet been satisfactorily answered, and, permit me to add, never will be. This demonstration, owing to its slightly impassioned style, its method of reasoning, which was so at variance with that employed by the generally recognized authorities, and the importance and novelty of its conclusions, was of a nature to cause some alarm. And might have been dangerous, had it not been, as you, sir, so well said, a sealed letter, so far as the general public was concerned, addressed only to men of intelligence. I was glad to see that through its metaphysical dress you recognize the wise foresight of the author, and I thank you for it. May God grant that my intentions, which are wholly peaceful, may never be charged upon me as treasonable. Like a stone thrown into a mass of serpents, the first memoir on property excited intense animosity, and aroused the passions of many. But, while some wished the author and his work to be publicly denounced, others found in them simply the solution of the fundamental problems of society, a few even basing evil speculations upon the new light which they had obtained. It was not to be expected that a system of inductions abstractly gathered together, and still more abstractly expressed, would be understood with equal accuracy in its ensemble and in each of its parts. To find the law of equality, no longer in charity and self-sacrifice, which are not binding in their nature, but in justice, to base equality of functions upon equality of persons, to determine the absolute principle of exchange. To neutralize the inequality of individual faculties by collective force, to establish an equation between property and robbery, to change the law of succession without destroying the principle. To maintain the human personality in a system of absolute association, and to save liberty from the chains of communism, to synthetize the monarchical and democratic forms of government, to reverse the division of powers. To give the executive power to the nation, and to make legislation a positive, fixed, and absolute science, what a series of paradoxes. 
what a string of delusions. If I may not say, what a chain of truths. But it is not my purpose here to pass upon the theory of the right of possession. I discuss no dogmas. My only object is to justify my views, and to show that, in writing as I did, I not only exercised a right, but performed a duty. Yes, I have attacked property, and shall attack it again. But, sir, before demanding that I shall make the amende honorable for having obeyed my conscience and spoken the exact truth, condescend, I beg of you, to cast a glance at the events which are happening around us. Look at our deputies, our magistrates, our philosophers, our ministers, our professors, and our publicists, examine their methods of dealing with the matter of property. Count up with me the restrictions placed upon it every day in the name of the public welfare, measure the breaches already made, estimate those which society thinks of making hereafter. Add the ideas concerning property held by all theories in common, interrogate history, and then tell me what will be left, half a century hence, of this old right of property. And, thus perceiving that I have so many accomplices, you will immediately declare me innocent. What is the law of expropriation on the ground of public utility, which everybody favors, and which is even thought too lenient? 40. A flagrant violation of the right of property. Society indemnifies, it is said, the dispossessed proprietor, but does it return to him the traditional associations, the poetic charm, and the family pride which accompany property? Naboth, and the miller of Sans Souci, would have protested against French law, as they protested against the caprice of their kings. It is the field of our fathers, they would have cried, and we will not sell it. Among the ancients, the refusal of the individual limited the powers of the state. The Roman law bowed to the will of the citizen, and an emperor, Commodus, if I remember rightly, abandoned the project of enlarging the forum out of respect for the rights of the occupants who refused to abdicate. Property is a real right, just in re, a right inherent in the thing, and whose principle lies in the external manifestation of man's will. Man leaves his imprint, stamps his character, upon the objects of his handiwork. This plastic force of man, as the modern jurists say, is the seal which, set upon matter, makes it holy. Whoever lays hands upon it, against the proprietor's will, does violence to the latter's personality. And yet, when an administrative committee saw fit to declare that public utility required it, property had to give way to the general will. Soon, in the name of public utility, methods of cultivation and conditions of enjoyment will be prescribed. Inspectors of agriculture and manufactures will be appointed, property will be taken away from unskillful hands, and entrusted to laborers who are more deserving of it, and a general superintendence of production will be established. It is not two years since I saw a proprietor destroy a forest more than 500 acres in extent. If public utility had interfered, that forest, the only one for miles around, would still be standing. But, it is said, expropriation on the ground of public utility is only an exception which confirms the principle, and bears testimony in favor of the right. Very well. But from this exception we will pass to another, from that to a third, and so on from exceptions to exceptions, until we have reduced the rule to a pure abstraction. How many supporters do you think, sir, can be claimed for the project of the conversion of the public funds? I venture to say that everybody favors it, except the fund holders. Now, this so-called conversion is an extensive expropriation, and in this case with no indemnity whatever. The public funds are so much real estate, the income from which the proprietor counts upon with perfect safety, and which owes its value to the tacit promise of the government to pay interest upon it at the established rate. Until the fund holder applies for redemption. For, if the income is liable to diminution, it is less profitable than house rent or farm rent, whose rates may rise or fall according to the fluctuations in the market. And in that case, what inducement has the capitalist to invest his money in the state? When, then, you force the fund holder to submit to a diminution of interest, you make him bankrupt to the extent of the diminution. And since, in consequence of the conversion, an equally profitable investment becomes impossible, you depreciate his property. That such a measure may be justly executed, it must be generalized. 
That is, the law which provides for it must decree also that interest on sums lent on deposit or on mortgage throughout the realm, as well as house and farm rents, shall be reduced to 3%. This simultaneous reduction of all kinds of income would be not a whit more difficult to accomplish than the proposed conversion. And, further, it would offer the advantage of forestalling at one blow all objections to it, at the same time that it would ensure a just assessment of the land tax. C. If at the moment of conversion a piece of real estate yields an income of 1,000 francs, after the new law takes effect it will yield only 600 francs. Now, allowing the tax to be an aliquot part, one-fourth for example, of the income derived from each piece of property, it is clear on the one hand that the proprietor would not, in order to lighten his share of the tax, underestimate the value of his property. Since, house and farm rents being fixed by the value of the capital, and the latter being measured by the tax, to depreciate his real estate would be to reduce his revenue. On the other hand, it is equally evident that the same proprietors could not overestimate the value of their property, in order to increase their incomes beyond the limits of the law, since the tenants and farmers, with their old leases in their hands, would enter a protest. Such, sir, must be the result sooner or later of the conversion which has been so long demanded, otherwise, the financial operation of which we are speaking would be a crying injustice, unless intended as a stepping stone. This last motive seems the most plausible one. For in spite of the clamors of interested parties, and the flagrant violation of certain rights, the public conscience is bound to fulfill its desire, and is no more affected when charged with attacking property than when listening to the complaints of the bondholders. In this case, instinctive justice belies legal justice. Who has not heard of the inextricable confusion into which the Chamber of Deputies was thrown last year, while discussing the question of colonial and native sugars? Did they leave these two industries to themselves? The native manufacturer was ruined by the colonist. To maintain the beetroot, the cane had to be taxed. To protect the property of the one, it became necessary to violate the property of the other. The most remarkable feature of this business was precisely that to which the least attention was paid, namely, that, in one way or another, property had to be violated. Did they impose on each industry a proportional tax, so as to preserve a balance in the market? They created a maximum price for each variety of sugar. And, as this maximum price was not the same, they attacked property in two ways, on the one hand, interfering with the liberty of trade, on the other, disregarding the equality of proprietors. Did they suppress the beetroot by granting an indemnity to the manufacturer? They sacrificed the property of the taxpayer. Finally, did they prefer to cultivate the two varieties of sugar at the nation's expense? just as different varieties of tobacco are cultivated? They abolished, so far as the sugar industry was concerned, the right of property. This last course, being the most social, would have been certainly the best, but, if property is the necessary basis of civilization, how is this deep-seated antagonism to be explained? 41. Not satisfied with the power of dispossessing a citizen on the ground of public utility, they want also to dispossess him on the ground of private utility. For a long time, a revision of the law concerning mortgages was clamored for. A process was demanded, in behalf of all kinds of credit and in the interest of even the debtors themselves, which would render the expropriation of real estate as prompt, as easy, and as effective as that which follows a commercial protest. The Chamber of Deputies, in the early part of this year, 1841, discussed this project, and the law was passed almost unanimously. There is nothing more just, nothing more reasonable, nothing more philosophical apparently, than the motives which gave rise to this reform. I. Formerly, the small proprietor whose obligation had arrived at maturity, and who found himself unable to meet it, had to employ all that he had left, after being released from his debt, in defraying the legal costs. Henceforth, the promptness of expropriation will save him from total ruin. 2. The difficulties in the way of payment arrested credit, and prevented the employment of capital in agricultural enterprises. This cause of distrust no longer existing, capitalists will find new markets, agriculture will rapidly develop, 
and farmers will be the first to enjoy the benefit of the new law. 3. Finally, it was iniquitous and absurd, that, on account of a protested note, a poor manufacturer should see in twenty-four hours his business arrested, his labor suspended, his merchandise seized, his machinery sold at auction. And finally himself led off to prison, while two years were sometimes necessary to expropriate the most miserable piece of real estate. These arguments, and others besides, you clearly stated, sir, in your first lectures of this academic year. But, when stating these excellent arguments, did you ask yourself, sir, whether would tend such a transformation of our system of mortgages? To monetize, if I may say so, landed property, to accumulate it within portfolios, to separate the laborer from the soil, man from nature, to make him a wanderer over the face of the earth. To eradicate from his heart every trace of family feeling, national pride, and love of country, to isolate him more and more, to render him indifferent to all around him, to concentrate his love upon one object, money. And, finally, by the dishonest practices of usury, to monopolize the land to the profit of a financial aristocracy, a worthy auxiliary of that industrial feudality whose pernicious influence we begin to feel so bitterly. Thus, little by little, the subordination of the laborer to the idler, the restoration of abolished castes, and the distinction between patrician and plebeian, would be effected. Thus, thanks to the new privileges granted to the property of the capitalists, that of the small and intermediate proprietors would gradually disappear, and with it the whole class of free and honest laborers. This certainly is not my plan for the abolition of property. Far from mobilizing the soil, I would, if possible, immobilize even the functions of pure intelligence, so that society might be the fulfillment of the intentions of nature, who gave us our first possession, the land. For, if the instrument or capital of production is the mark of the laborer, it is also his pedestal, his support, his country, and, as the psalmist says, the place of his activity in his rest. 42. Let us examine more closely still the inevitable and approaching result of the last law concerning judicial sales and mortgages. Under the system of competition which is killing us, and whose necessary expression is a plundering and tyrannical government, the farmer will need always capital in order to repair his losses, and will be forced to contract loans. Always depending upon the future for the payment of his debts, he will be deceived in his hope, and surprised by maturity. For what is there more prompt, more unexpected, more abbreviatory of space and time, than the maturity of an obligation? I address this question to all whom this pitiless nemesis pursues, and even troubles in their dreams. Now, under the new law, the expropriation of a debtor will be effected a hundred times more rapidly. Then, also, spoliation will be a hundred times sure, and the free laborer will pass a hundred times sooner from his present condition to that of a serf attached to the soil. Formerly, the length of time required to effect the seizure curbed the usurer's avidity, gave the borrower an opportunity to recover himself, and gave rise to a transaction between him and his creditor which might result finally in a complete release. Now, the debtor's sentence is irrevocable, he has but a few days of grace. And what advantages are promised by this law as an offset to this sort of Damocles, suspended by a single hair over the head of the unfortunate husbandman? The expenses of seizure will be much less, it is said, but will the interest on the borrowed capital be less exorbitant? For, after all, it is interest which impoverishes the peasant and leads to his expropriation. That the law may be in harmony with its principle, that it may be truly inspired by that spirit of justice for which it is commended, it must, while facilitating expropriation, lower the legal price of money. Otherwise, the reform concerning mortgages is but a trap set for small proprietors, a legislative trick. Lower interest on money. But, as we have just seen, that is to limit property. Here, sir, you shall make your own defense. More than once, in your learned lectures, I have heard you deplore the precipitancy of the chambers, who, without previous study and without profound knowledge of the subject, voted almost unanimously to maintain the statutes and privileges of the bank. Now these privileges, these statutes, this vote of the chambers, mean simply this, that the market price of specie, at five or six percent, is not too high, 
and that the conditions of exchange, discount, and circulation, which generally double this interest, are none too severe. So the government thinks. M. Blanky, a professor of political economy, paid by the state, maintains the contrary, and pretends to demonstrate, by decisive arguments, the necessity of a reform. Who, then, best understands the interests of property, the state, or M. Blanky? If specie could be borrowed at half the present rate, the revenues from all sorts of property would soon be reduced one half also. For example, when it costs less to build a house than to hire one, when it is cheaper to clear a field than to procure one already cleared, competition inevitably leads to a reduction of house and farm rents. Since the surest way to depreciate active capital is to increase its amount. But it is a law of political economy that an increase of production augments the mass of available capital, consequently tends to raise wages, and finally to annihilate interest. Then, proprietors are interested in maintaining the statutes and privileges of the bank, then, a reform in this matter would compromise the right of increase, then, the peers and deputies are better informed than Professor Blanky. But these same deputies, so jealous of their privileges whenever the equalizing effects of a reform are within their intellectual horizon, what did they do a few days before they passed the law concerning judicial sales? They formed a conspiracy against property. Their law to regulate the labor of children in factories will, without doubt, prevent the manufacturer from compelling a child to labor more than so many hours a day. But it will not force him to increase the pay of the child, nor that of its father. Today, in the interest of health, we diminish the subsistence of the poor, tomorrow it will be necessary to protect them by fixing their minimum wages. But to fix their minimum wages is to compel the proprietor, is to force the master to accept his workman as an associate, which interferes with freedom and makes mutual insurance obligatory. Once entered upon this path, we never shall stop. Little by little the government will become manufacturer, commission merchant, and retail dealer. It will be the sole proprietor. Why, at all epochs, have the ministers of state been so reluctant to meddle with the question of wages? Why have they always refused to interfere between the master and the workman? Because they knew the touchy and jealous nature of property, and, regarding it as the principle of all civilization, felt that to meddle with it would be to unsettle the very foundations of society. Sad condition of the proprietary regime, one of inability to exercise charity without violating justice, 43. And, sir, this fatal consequence which necessity forces upon the state is no mere imagination. Even now the legislative power is asked, no longer simply to regulate the government of factories, but to create factories itself. Listen to the millions of voices shouting on all hands for the organization of labor, the creation of national workshops. The whole laboring class is agitated, it has its journals, organs, and representatives. To guarantee labor to the workingmen, to balance production with sale, to harmonize industrial proprietors, it advocates today, as a sovereign remedy, one sole head, one national wardenship, one huge manufacturing company. For, sir, all this is included in the idea of national workshops. On this subject I wish to quote, as proof, the views of an illustrious economist, a brilliant mind, a progressive intellect, an enthusiastic soul, a true patriot, and yet an official defender of the right of property. 44. The Honorable Professor of the Conservatory proposes then. 1. To check the continual emigration of laborers from the country into the cities. But, to keep the peasant in his village, his residence there must be made endurable, to be just to all, the proletaire of the country must be treated as well as the proletaire of the city. Reform is needed, then, on farms as well as in factories. And, when the government enters the workshop, the government must seize the plow. What becomes, during this progressive invasion, of independent cultivation, exclusive domain, property? 2. To fix for each profession a moderate salary, varying with time and place and based upon certain data. The object of this measure would be to secure to laborers their subsistence, and to proprietors their profits, while obliging the latter to sacrifice from motives of prudence, if for no other reason, a portion of their income. Now, I say, that this portion, 
in the long run, would swell until at last there would be an equality of enjoyment between the proletaire and the proprietor. For, as we have had occasion to remark several times already, the interest of the capitalist, in other words the increase of the idler, tends, on account of the power of labor, the multiplication of products and exchanges, to continually diminish. And, by constant reduction, to disappear. So that, in the society proposed by M. Blanky, equality would not be realized at first, but would exist potentially. Since property, though outwardly seeming to be industrial feudality, being no longer a principle of exclusion and encroachment, but only a privilege of division, would not be slow. Thanks to the intellectual and political emancipation of the proletariat, in passing into absolute equality, as absolute at least as anything can be on this earth. I omit, for the sake of brevity, the numerous considerations which the professor adduces in support of what he calls, too modestly in my opinion, his utopia. They would serve only to prove beyond all question that, of all the charlatans of radicalism who fatigue the public ear, no one approaches, for depth and clearness of thought, the audacious M. Blanky. 3. National workshops should be in operation only during periods of stagnation in ordinary industries, at such times they should be opened as vast outlets to the flood of the laboring population. But, sir, the stoppage of private industry is the result of overproduction and insufficient markets. If, then, production continues in the national workshops, how will the crisis be terminated? Undoubtedly, by the general depreciation of merchandise, and, in the last analysis, by the conversion of private workshops into national workshops. On the other hand, the government will need capital with which to pay its workmen. Now, how will this capital be obtained? By taxation. And upon what will the tax be levied? Upon property. Then you will have proprietary industry sustaining against itself, and at its own expense, another industry with which it cannot compete. What, think you, will become, in this fatal circle, of the possibility of profit, in a word, of property? Thank heaven. Equality of conditions is taught in the public schools, let us fear revolutions no longer. The most implacable enemy of property could not, if he wished to destroy it, go to work in a wiser and more effective way. Courage, then, ministers, deputies, economists. Make haste to seize this glorious initiative. Let the watchwords of equality, uttered from the heights of science and power, be repeated in the midst of the people, let them thrill the breasts of the proletaires, and carry dismay into the ranks of the last representatives of privilege. The tendency of society in favor of compelling proprietors to support national workshops and public manufactories is so strong that for several years, under the name of electoral reform, it has been exclusively the question of the day. What is, after all, this electoral reform which the people grasp at, as if it were a bait, and which so many ambitious persons either call for or denounce? It is the acknowledgement of the right of the masses to a voice in the assessment of taxes, and the making of the laws. Which laws, aiming always at the protection of material interests, affect, in a greater or less degree, all questions of taxation or wages? Now the people, instructed long since by their journals, their dramas 45 and their songs 46 know today that taxation, to be equitably divided, must be graduated, and must be borne mainly by the rich, that it must be levied upon luxuries, etc. And be sure that the people, once in the majority in the chamber, will not fail to apply these lessons. Already we have a minister of public works. National workshops will follow. And soon, as a consequence, the excess of the proprietor's revenue over the working men's wages will be swallowed up in the coffers of the laborers of the state. Do you not see that in this way property is gradually reduced, as nobility was formerly, to a nominal title, to a distinction purely honorary in its nature? Either the electoral reform will fail to accomplish that which is hoped from it, and will disappoint its innumerable partisans. Or else it will inevitably result in a transformation of the absolute right under which we live into a right of possession. That is, that while, at present, property makes the elector, after this reform is accomplished, the citizen, the producer will be the possessor. 47 Consequently, 
the radicals are right in saying that the electoral reform is in their eyes only a means, but, when they are silent as to the end, they show either profound ignorance, or useless dissimulation. There should be no secrets or reservations from peoples and powers. He disgraces himself and fails in respect for his fellows, who, in publishing his opinions, employs evasion and cunning. Before the people act, they need to know the whole truth. Unhappy he who shall dare to trifle with them. For the people are credulous, but they are strong. Let us tell them, then, that this reform which is proposed is only a means, a means often tried, and hitherto without effect, but that the logical object of the electoral reform is equality of fortunes. And that this equality itself is only a new means having in view the superior and definitive object of the salvation of society, the restoration of morals and religion, and the revival of poetry and art. It would be an abuse of the reader's patience to insist further upon the tendency of our time towards equality. There are, moreover, so many people who denounce the present age, that nothing is gained by exposing to their view the popular, scientific, and representative tendencies of the nation. Prompt to recognize the accuracy of the inferences drawn from observation, they confine themselves to a general censure of the facts, and an absolute denial of their legitimacy. What wonder, they say, that this atmosphere of equality intoxicates us, considering all that has been said and done during the past ten years. Do you not see that society is dissolving, that a spirit of infatuation is carrying us away? All these hopes of regeneration are but forebodings of death, your songs of triumph are like the prayers of the departing, your trumpet peals announce the baptism of a dying man. Civilization is falling in ruin, imus, imus, precipits. Such people deny God. I might content myself with the reply that the spirit of 1830 was the result of the maintenance of the violated charter, that this charter arose from the revolution of 89. That 89 implies the state's general's right of remonstrance, and the enfranchisement of the communes, that the communes suppose feudalism, which in its turn supposes invasion, Roman law, Christianity, etc. But it is necessary to look further. We must penetrate to the very heart of ancient institutions, plunge into the social depths, and uncover this indestructible leaven of equality which the God of justice breathed into our souls, and which manifests itself in all our works. Labor is man's contemporary, it is a duty, since it is a condition of existence, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. It is more than a duty, it is a mission, God put the man into the garden to dress it. I add that labor is the cause and means of equality. Cast away upon a desert island two men, one large, strong, and active, the other weak, timid, and domestic. The latter will die of hunger. While the other, a skillful hunter, an expert fisherman, and an indefatigable husbandman, will overstock himself with provisions. What greater inequality, in this state of nature so dear to the heart of Jean Jacques, could be imagined? But let these two men meet and associate themselves, the second immediately attends to the cooking, takes charge of the household affairs, and sees to the provisions, beds, and clothes. Provided the stronger does not abuse his superiority by enslaving and ill-treating his companion, their social condition will be perfectly equal. Thus, through exchange of services, the inequalities of nature neutralize each other, talents associate, and forces balance. Violence and inertia are found only among the poor and the aristocratic. And in that lies the philosophy of political economy, the mystery of human brotherhood. Hic est sapientia. Let us pass from the hypothetical state of pure nature into civilization. The proprietor of the soil, who produces, I will suppose with the economists, by lending his instrument, receives at the foundation of a society so many bushels of grain for each acre of arable land. As long as labor is weak, and the variety of its products small, the proprietor is powerful in comparison with the laborers, he has ten times, one hundred times, the portion of an honest man. But let labor, by multiplying its inventions, multiply its enjoyments and wants, and the proprietor, if he wishes to enjoy the new products, will be obliged to reduce his income every day. And since the first products tend rather to depreciate than to rise in value, in consequence of the continual addition of the new ones. 
which may be regarded as supplements of the first ones, it follows that the idle proprietor grows poor as fast as public prosperity increases. Incomes, I like to quote you, sir, because it is impossible to give too good an authority for these elementary principles of economy, and because I cannot express them better myself, incomes, you have said, tend to disappear as capital increases. He who possesses today an income of £20,000 is not nearly as rich as he who possessed the same amount 50 years ago. The time is coming when all property will be a burden to the idle, and will necessarily pass into the hands of the able and industrious. 48. In order to live as a proprietor, or to consume without producing, it is necessary, then, to live upon the labor of another, in other words, it is necessary to kill the laborer. It is upon this principle that proprietors of those varieties of capital which are of primary necessity increase their farm rents as fast as industry develops, much more careful of their privileges in that respect, than those economists who, in order to strengthen property, advocate a reduction of interest. But the crime is unavailing, labor and production increase, soon the proprietor will be forced to labor, and then property is lost. The proprietor is a man who, having absolute control of an instrument of production, claims the right to enjoy the product of the instrument without using it himself. To this end he lends it. And we have just seen that from this loan the laborer derives a power of exchange, which sooner or later will destroy the right of increase. In the first place, the proprietor is obliged to allow the laborer a portion of the product, for without it the laborer could not live. Soon the latter, through the development of his industry, finds a means of regaining the greater portion of that which he gives to the proprietor. So that at last, the objects of enjoyment increasing continually, while the income of the idler remains the same, the proprietor, having exhausted his resources, begins to think of going to work himself. Then the victory of the producer is certain. Labor commences to tip the balance towards its own side, and commerce leads to equilibrium. Man's instinct cannot err. As, in liberty, exchange of functions leads inevitably to equality among men, so commerce, or exchange of products, which is identical with exchange of functions, is a new cause of equality. As long as the proprietor does not labor, however small his income, he enjoys a privilege, the laborer's welfare may be equal to his, but equality of conditions does not exist. But as soon as the proprietor becomes a producer, since he can exchange his special product only with his tenant or his commandite, sooner or later this tenant, this exploited man, if violence is not done him, will make a profit out of the proprietor, and will oblige him to restore, in the exchange of their respective products, the interest on his capital. So that, balancing one injustice by another, the contracting parties will be equal. Labor and exchange, when liberty prevails, lead, then, to equality of fortunes, mutuality of services neutralizes privilege. That is why despots in all ages and countries have assumed control of commerce, they wish to prevent the labor of their subjects from becoming an obstacle to the rapacity of tyrants. Up to this point, all takes place in the natural order. There is no premeditation, no artifice. The whole proceeding is governed by the laws of necessity alone. Proprietors and laborers act only in obedience to their wants. Thus, the exercise of the right of increase, the art of robbing the producer, depends, during this first period of civilization, upon physical violence, murder, and war. But at this point a gigantic and complicated conspiracy is hatched against the capitalists. The weapon of the exploiters is met by the exploited with the instrument of commerce, a marvelous invention, denounced at its origin by the moralists who favored property, but inspired without doubt by the genius of labor. By the Minerva of the Proletaires. The principal cause of the evil lay in the accumulation and immobility of capital of all sorts, an immobility which prevented labor, enslaved and subalternized by haughty idleness, from ever acquiring it. The necessity was felt of dividing and mobilizing wealth, of rendering it portable, of making it pass from the hands of the possessor into those of the worker. Labor invented money. Afterwards, this invention was revived and developed by the bill of exchange and the bank. For all these things are substantially the same, and proceed from the same mind. 
The first man who conceived the idea of representing a value by a shell, a precious stone, or a certain weight of metal, was the real inventor of the bank. What is a piece of money, in fact? It is a bill of exchange written upon solid and durable material, and carrying with it its own redemption. By this means, oppressed equality was enabled to laugh at the efforts of the proprietors, and the balance of justice was adjusted for the first time in the tradesman's shop. The trap was cunningly set, and accomplished its purpose so thoroughly that in idle hands money became only dissolving wealth, a false symbol, a shadow of riches. An excellent economist and profound philosopher was that miser who took as his motto, when a guinea is exchanged, it evaporates. So it may be said, when real estate is converted into money, it is lost. This explains the constant fact of history, that the nobles, the unproductive proprietors of the soil, have everywhere been dispossessed by industrial and commercial plebeians. Such was especially the case in the formation of the Italian republics, born, during the Middle Ages, of the impoverishment of the seigneurs. I will not pursue the interesting considerations which this matter suggests. I could only repeat the testimony of historians, and present economical demonstrations in an altered form. The greatest enemy of the landed and industrial aristocracy today, the incessant promoter of equality of fortunes, is the banker. Through him immense plains are divided, mountains change their positions, forests are grown upon the public squares, one hemisphere produces for another, and every corner of the globe has its usufructuaries. By means of the bank new wealth is continually created, the use of which, soon becoming indispensable to selfishness, wrests the dormant capital from the hands of the jealous proprietor. The banker is at once the most potent creator of wealth, and the main distributor of the products of art and nature. And yet, by the strangest antinomy, this same banker is the most relentless collector of profits, increase, and usury ever inspired by the demon of property. The importance of the services which he renders leads us to endure, though not without complaint, the taxes which he imposes. Nevertheless, since nothing can avoid its providential mission, since nothing which exists can escape the end for which it exists the banker, the modern Croesus, must some day become the restorer of equality. And following in your footsteps, sir, I have already given the reason. Namely, that profit decreases as capital multiplies, since an increase of capital, calling for more laborers, without whom it remains unproductive, always causes an increase of wages. Whence it follows that the bank, today the suction pump of wealth, is destined to become the steward of the human race. The phrase equality of fortunes chafes people, as if it referred to a condition of the other world, unknown here below. There are some persons, radicals as well as moderates, whom the very mention of this idea fills with indignation. Let, then, these silly aristocrats abolish mercantile societies and insurance companies, which are founded by prudence for mutual assistance. For all these social facts, so spontaneous and free from all leveling intentions, are the legitimate fruits of the instinct of equality. When the legislator makes a law, properly speaking he does not make it, he does not create it, he describes it. In legislating upon the moral, civil, and political relations of citizens, he does not express an arbitrary notion, he states the general idea, the higher principle which governs the matter which he is considering. In a word, he is the proclaimer, not the inventor, of the law. So, when two or more men form among themselves, by synalagmatic contract, an industrial or an insurance association, they recognize that their interests, formerly isolated by a false spirit of selfishness and independence, are firmly connected by their inner natures, and by the mutuality of their relations. They do not really bind themselves by an act of their private will, they swear to conform henceforth to a previously existing social law hitherto disregarded by them. And this is proved by the fact that these same men, could they avoid association, would not associate. Before they can be induced to unite their interests, they must acquire full knowledge of the dangers of competition and isolation. Hence the experience of evil is the only thing which leads them into society. Now I say that, to establish equality among men, it is only necessary to generalize the principle upon which insurance, agricultural, and commercial associations are based. 
I say that competition, isolation of interests, monopoly, privilege, accumulation of capital, exclusive enjoyment, subordination of functions, individual production, the right of profit or increase, the exploitation of man by man, and to sum up all these species under one head, that property is the principal cause of misery and crime. And, for having arrived at this offensive and anti-proprietary conclusion, I am an abhorred monster, radicals and conservatives alike point me out as a fit subject for prosecution, the academies shower their censures upon me. The most worthy people regard me as mad, and those are excessively tolerant who content themselves with the assertion that I am a fool. Oh, unhappy the writer who publishes the truth otherwise than as a performance of a duty. If he has counted upon the applause of the crowd, if he has supposed that avarice and self-interest would forget themselves in admiration of him. If he has neglected to encase himself within three thicknesses of brass, he will fail, as he ought, in his selfish undertaking. The unjust criticisms, the sad disappointments, the despair of his mistaken ambition, will kill him. But, if I am no longer permitted to express my own personal opinion concerning this interesting question of social equilibrium, let me, at least, make known the thought of my masters. And develop the doctrines advocated in the name of the government. It never has been my intention, sir, in spite of the vigorous censure which you, in behalf of your academy, have pronounced upon the doctrine of equality of fortunes, to contradict and cope with you. In listening to you, I have felt my inferiority too keenly to permit me to enter upon such a discussion. And then, if it must be said, however different your language is from mine, we believe in the same principles, you share all my opinions. I do not mean to insinuate thereby, sir, that you have, to use the phraseology of the schools, an esoteric and an exoteric doctrine, that, secretly believing in equality, you defend property only from motives of prudence and by command. I am not rash enough to regard you as my colleague in my revolutionary projects, and I esteem you too highly, moreover, to suspect you of dissimulation. I only mean that the truths which methodical investigation and laborious metaphysical speculation have painfully demonstrated to me, a profound acquaintance with political economy and a long experience reveal to you. While I have reached my belief in equality by long reflection, and almost in spite of my desires, you hold yours, sir, with all the zeal of faith, with all the spontaneity of genius. That is why your course of lectures at the conservatory is a perpetual war upon property and inequality of fortunes. That is why your most learned investigations, your most ingenious analyses, and your innumerable observations always conclude in a formula of progress and equality. That is why, finally, you are never more admired and applauded than at those moments of inspiration when, born upon the wings of science, you ascend to those lofty truths which cause plebeian hearts to beat with enthusiasm. And which chill with horror men whose intentions are evil. How many times, from the place where I eagerly drank in your eloquent words, have I inwardly thanked heaven for exempting you from the judgment passed by esti. Paul upon the philosophers of his time, they have known the truth, and have not made it known. How many times have I rejoiced at finding my own justification in each of your discourses? No, no. I neither wish nor ask for anything which you do not teach yourself. I appeal to your numerous audience, let it belie me if, in commenting upon you, I pervert your meaning. A disciple of say, what in your eyes is more antisocial than the custom houses, or, as you correctly call them, the barriers erected by monopoly between nations? What is more annoying, more unjust, or more absurd, than this prohibitory system which compels us to pay forty sous in France for that which in England or Belgium would bring us but fifteen? It is the Custom House, you once said, forty-nine which arrests the development of civilization by preventing the specialization of industries, it is the Custom House which enriches a hundred monopolists by impoverishing millions of citizens. It is the custom house which produces famine in the midst of abundance, which makes labor sterile by prohibiting exchange, and which stifles production in a mortal embrace. It is the custom house which renders nations jealous of, and hostile to, each other, four-fifths of the wars of all ages were caused originally by the custom house. And then, at the highest pitch of your enthusiasm, you shouted, yes, if to put an end to this hateful system, 
it should become necessary for me to shed the last drop of my blood, I would joyfully spring into the gap. Asking only time enough to give thanks to God for having judged me worthy of martyrdom. And, at that solemn moment, I said to myself, place in every department of France such a professor as that, and the revolution is avoided. But, sir, by this magnificent theory of liberty of commerce you render military glory impossible, you leave nothing for diplomacy to do, you even take away the desire for conquest, while abolishing profit altogether. What matters it, indeed, who restores Constantinople, Alexandria, and St. Jean d'Acre, if the Syrians, Egyptians, and Turks are free to choose their masters, free to exchange their products with whom they please? Why should Europe get into such a turmoil over this petty sultan and his old pasha, if it is only a question whether we or the English shall civilize the Orient, shall instruct Egypt and Syria in the European arts, and shall teach them to construct machines, dig canals, and build railroads? For, if to national independence free trade is added, the foreign influence of these two countries is thereafter exerted only through a voluntary relationship of producer to producer, or apprentice to journeyman. Alone among European powers, France cheerfully accepted the task of civilizing the Orient, and began an invasion which was quite apostolic in its character, so joyful and high-minded do noble thoughts render our nation. But diplomatic rivalry, national selfishness, English avarice, and Russian ambition stood in her way. To consummate a long-meditated usurpation, it was necessary to crush a too generous ally, the robbers of the Holy Alliance formed a league against dauntless and blameless France. Consequently, at the news of this famous treaty, there arose among us a chorus of curses upon the principle of property, which at that time was acting under the hypocritical formulas of the old political system. The last hour of property seemed to have struck by the side of Syria, from the Alps to the ocean, from the Rhine to the Pyrenees, the popular conscience was aroused. All France sang songs of war, and the coalition turned pale at the sound of these shuddering cries, war upon the autocrat, who wishes to be proprietor of the old world. War upon the English perjurer, the devourer of India, the poisoner of China, the tyrant of Ireland, and the eternal enemy of France. War upon the allies who have conspired against liberty and equality. War. War. War upon property. By the Council of Providence the emancipation of the nations is postponed. France is to conquer, not by arms, but by example. Universal reason does not yet understand this grand equation, which, commencing with the abolition of slavery, and advancing over the ruins of aristocracies and thrones, must end in equality of rights and fortunes. But the day is not far off when the knowledge of this truth will be as common as that of equality of origin. Already it seems to be understood that the Oriental question is only a question of custom houses. Is it, then, so difficult for public opinion to generalize this idea, and to comprehend, finally, that if the suppression of custom houses involves the abolition of national property, it involves also, as a consequence, the abolition of individual property? In fact, if we suppress the custom houses, the alliance of the nations is declared by that very act their solidarity is recognized, and their equality proclaimed. If we suppress the custom houses, the principle of association will not be slow in reaching from the state to the province, from the province to the city, and from the city to the workshop. But, then, what becomes of the privileges of authors and artists? Of what use are the patents for invention, imagination, amelioration, and improvement? When our deputies write a law of literary property by the side of a law which opens a large breach in the custom house they contradict themselves, indeed, and pull down with one hand what they build up with the other. Without the custom house, literary property does not exist, and the hopes of our starving authors are frustrated. For, certainly you do not expect, with the good man Fourier, that literary property will exercise itself in China to the profit of a French writer. And that an ode of Lamartine, sold by privilege all over the world, will bring in millions to its author. The poet's work is peculiar to the climate in which he lives. Everywhere else the reproduction of his works, having no market value, should be frank and free. But what? Will it be necessary for nations to put themselves under mutual surveillance for the sake of verses, statues, 
and elixirs. We shall always have, then, an excise, a city toll, rights of entrance and transit, custom houses finally, and then, as a reaction against privilege, smuggling. Smuggling. That word reminds me of one of the most horrible forms of property. Smuggling, you have said, sir, 50, is an offense of political creation, it is the exercise of natural liberty, defined as a crime in certain cases by the will of the sovereign. The smuggler is a gallant man, a man of spirit, who gaily busies himself in procuring for his neighbor, at a very low price, a jewel, a shawl, or any other object of necessity or luxury, which domestic monopoly renders excessively dear. Then, to a very poetical monograph of the smuggler, you add this dismal conclusion, that the smuggler belongs to the family of Mandarin, and that the galleys should be his home. But, sir, you have not called attention to the horrible exploitation which is carried on in this way in the name of property. It is said, and I give this report only as an hypothesis and an illustration, for I do not believe it, it is said that the present minister of finances owes his fortune to smuggling. M. Human, of Strasbourg, sent out of France, it is said, enormous quantities of sugar, for which he received the bounty on exportation promised by the state. Then, smuggling this sugar back again, he exported it anew, receiving the bounty on exportation a second time, and so on. Notice, sir, that I do not state this as a fact, I give it only as it is told, not endorsing or even believing it. My sole design is to fix the idea in the mind by an example. If I believed that a minister had committed such a crime, that is, if I had personal and authentic knowledge that he had, I would denounce M. Human, the Minister of Finances, to the Chamber of Deputies, and would loudly demand his expulsion from the ministry. But that which is undoubtedly false of M. Human is true of many others, as rich and no less honorable than he. Smuggling, organized on a large scale by the eaters of human flesh, is carried on to the profit of a few pashas at the risk and peril of their imprudent victims. The inactive proprietor offers his merchandise for sale. The actual smuggler risks his liberty, his honor, and his life. If success crowns the enterprise, the courageous servant gets paid for his journey, the profit goes to the coward. If fortune or treachery delivers the instrument of this execrable traffic into the hands of the custom house officer, the master smuggler suffers a loss which a more fortunate voyage will soon repair. The agent, pronounced a scoundrel, is thrown into prison in company with robbers, while his glorious patron, a juror, elector, deputy, or minister, makes laws concerning expropriation, monopoly, and custom houses. I promised, at the beginning of this letter, that no attack on property should escape my pen, my only object being to justify myself before the public by a general recrimination. But I could not refrain from branding so odious a mode of exploitation, and I trust that this short digression will be pardoned. Property does not avenge, I hope, the injuries which smuggling suffers. The conspiracy against property is general. It is flagrant, it takes possession of all minds, and inspires all our laws, it lies at the bottom of all theories. Here the proletaire pursues property in the street, there the legislator lays an interdict upon it. Now, a professor of political economy or of industrial legislation, 51 paid to defend it, undermines it with redoubled blows, at another, time, an academy calls it in question, 52 or inquires as to the progress of its demolition. 53 today there is not an idea, not an opinion, not a sect, which does not dream of muzzling property. None confess it, because none are yet conscious of it. There are too few minds capable of grasping spontaneously this ensemble of causes and effects, of principles and consequences, by which I try to demonstrate the approaching disappearance of property. On the other hand, the ideas that are generally formed of this right are too divergent and too loosely determined to allow an admission, so soon, of the contrary theory. Thus, in the middle and lower ranks of literature and philosophy, no less than among the common people, it is thought that, when property is abolished, no one will be able to enjoy the fruit of his labor. That no one will have anything peculiar to himself, and that tyrannical communism will be established on the ruins of family and liberty. Chimeras, which are to support for a little while longer the cause of privilege. 
But, before determining precisely the idea of property, before seeking amid the contradictions of systems for the common element which must form the basis of the new right, let us cast a rapid glance at the changes which, at the various periods of history, property has undergone. The political forms of nations are the expression of their beliefs. The mobility of these forms, their modification and their destruction, are solemn experiences which show us the value of ideas, and gradually eliminate from the infinite variety of customs the absolute, eternal, and immutable truth. Now, we shall see that every political institution tends, necessarily, and on pain of death, to equalize conditions. That everywhere and always equality of fortunes, like equality of rights, has been the social aim, whether the plebeian classes have endeavored to rise to political power by means of property. Or whether, rulers already, they have used political power to overthrow property. We shall see, in short, by the progress of society, that the consummation of justice lies in the extinction of individual domain. For the sake of brevity, I will disregard the testimony of ecclesiastical history and Christian theology, this subject deserves a separate treatise, and I propose hereafter to return to it. Moses and Jesus Christ proscribed, under the names of usury and inequality, 54 all sorts of profit and increase. The Church itself, in its purest teachings, has always condemned property. And when I attacked, not only the authority of the Church, but also its infidelity to justice, I did it to the glory of religion. I wanted to provoke a peremptory reply, and to pave the way for Christianity's triumph, in spite of the innumerable attacks of which it is at present the object. I hoped that an apologist would arise forthwith, and, taking his stand upon the scriptures, the fathers, the canons, and the councils and constitutions of the popes, would demonstrate that the Church always has maintained the doctrine of equality, and would attribute to temporary necessity the contradictions of its discipline. Such a labor would serve the cause of religion as well as that of equality. We must know, sooner or later, whether Christianity is to be regenerated in the Church or out of it, and whether this Church accepts the reproaches cast upon it of hatred to liberty and antipathy to progress. Until then we will suspend judgment, and content ourselves with placing before the clergy the teachings of history. When Lycurgus undertook to make laws for Sparta, in what condition did he find this republic? On this point all historians agree. The people and the nobles were at war. The city was in a confused state, and divided by two parties, the party of the poor, and the party of the rich. Hardly escaped from the barbarism of the heroic ages, society was rapidly declining. The proletariat made war upon property, which, in its turn, oppressed the proletariat. What did Lycurgus do? His first measure was one of general security, at the very idea of which our legislators would tremble. He abolished all debts. Then, employing by turns persuasion and force, he induced the nobles to renounce their privileges, and re-established equality. Lycurgus, in a word, hunted property out of Lacedaemon, seeing no other way to harmonize liberty, equality, and law. I certainly should not wish France to follow the example of Sparta. But it is remarkable that the most ancient of Greek legislators, thoroughly acquainted with the nature and needs of the people, more capable than anyone else of appreciating the legitimacy of the obligations which he, in the exercise of his absolute authority, cancelled, who had compared the legislative systems of his time, and whose wisdom an oracle had proclaimed, it is remarkable, I say, that Lycurgus should have judged the right of property incompatible with free institutions and should have thought it his duty to preface his legislation by a coup d'état which destroyed all distinctions of fortune. Lycurgus understood perfectly that the luxury, the love of enjoyments, and the inequality of fortunes, which property engenders, are the bane of society. Unfortunately the means which he employed to preserve his republic were suggested to him by false notions of political economy, and by a superficial knowledge of the human heart. Accordingly, property, which this legislator wrongly confounded with wealth, re-entered the city together with the swarm of evils which he was endeavouring to banish, and this time Sparta was hopelessly corrupted. The introduction of wealth, says M. Pastoret, was one of the principal causes of the misfortunes which they experienced. 
Against these, however, the laws had taken extraordinary precautions, the best among which was the inculcation of morals which tended to suppress desire. The best of all precautions would have been the anticipation of desire by satisfaction. Possession is the sovereign remedy for cupidity, a remedy which would have been the less perilous to Sparta because fortunes there were almost equal, and conditions were nearly alike. As a general thing, fasting and abstinence are bad teachers of moderation. There was a law, says M. Pastoret again, to prohibit the rich from wearing better clothing than the poor, from eating more delicate food, and from owning elegant furniture, vases, carpets, fine houses, etc. Lycurgus hoped, then, to maintain equality by rendering wealth useless. How much wiser he would have been if, in accordance with his military discipline, he had organized industry and taught the people to procure by their own labor the things which he tried in vain to deprive them of. In that case, enjoying happy thoughts and pleasant feelings, the citizen would have known no other desire than that with which the legislator endeavored to inspire him, love of honor and glory, the triumphs of talent and virtue. Gold and all kinds of ornaments were forbidden the women. Absurd. After the death of Lycurgus, his institutions became corrupted, and four centuries before the Christian era not a vestige remained of the former simplicity. Luxury and the thirst for gold were early developed among the Spartans in a degree as intense as might have been expected from their enforced poverty and their inexperience in the arts. Historians have accused Pausanias, Lysander, Agesilaus, and others of having corrupted the morals of their country by the introduction of wealth obtained in war. It is a slander. The morals of the Spartans necessarily grew corrupt as soon as the Lacedaemonian poverty came in contact with Persian luxury and Athenian elegance. Lycurgus, then, made a fatal mistake in attempting to inspire generosity and modesty by enforcing vain and proud simplicity. Lycurgus was not frightened at idleness. A Lacedaemonian, happening to be in Athens, where idleness was forbidden, during the punishment of a citizen who had been found guilty, asked to see the Athenian thus condemned for having exercised the rights of a free man. It was one of the principles of Lycurgus, acted upon for several centuries, that free men should not follow lucrative professions. The women disdained domestic labor. They did not spin their wool themselves, as did the other Greeks, they did not, then, read Homer, they left their slaves to make their clothing for them. Pastoret, History of Legislation could anything be more contradictory? Lycurgus proscribed property among the citizens, and founded the means of subsistence on the worst form of property, on property obtained by force. What wonder, after that, that a lazy city, where no industry was carried on, became a den of avarice. The Spartans succumbed the more easily to the allurements of luxury and Asiatic voluptuousness, being placed entirely at their mercy by their own coarseness. The same thing happened to the Romans, when military success took them out of Italy, a thing which the author of the Prosopopoeia of Fabricius could not explain. It is not the cultivation of the arts which corrupts morals, but their degradation, induced by inactive and luxurious opulence. The instinct of property is to make the industry of Daedalus, as well as the talent of Phidias, subservient to its own fantastic whims and disgraceful pleasures. Property, not wealth, ruined the Spartans. When Solon appeared, the anarchy caused by property was at its height in the Athenian Republic. The inhabitants of Attica were divided among themselves as to the form of government. Those who lived on the mountains, the poor, preferred the popular form, those of the plain, the middle class, the oligarchs, those by the sea coast, a mixture of oligarchy and democracy. Other dissensions were arising from the inequality of fortunes. The mutual antagonism of the rich and poor had become so violent, that the one-man power seemed the only safeguard against the revolution with which the republic was threatened. Pastoret, History of Legislation Quarrels between the rich and the poor, which seldom occur in monarchies, because a well-established power suppresses dissensions, seem to be the life of popular governments. Aristotle had noticed this. The oppression of wealth submitted to agrarian laws, or to excessive taxation. The hatred of the lower classes for the upper class, which is exposed always to libelous charges made in hopes of confiscation, 
these were the features of the Athenian government which were especially revolting to Aristotle. And which caused him to favor a limited monarchy. Aristotle, if he had lived in our day, would have supported the constitutional government. But, with all deference to the Stagirite, a government which sacrifices the life of the proletaire to that of the proprietor is quite as irrational as one which supports the former by robbing the latter. Neither of them deserve the support of a free man, much less of a philosopher. Solon followed the example of Lycurgus. He celebrated his legislative inauguration by the abolition of debts, that is, by bankruptcy. In other words, Solon wound up the governmental machine for a longer or shorter time depending upon the rate of interest. Consequently, when the spring relaxed and the chain became unwound, the republic had either to perish, or to recover itself by a second bankruptcy. This singular policy was pursued by all the ancients. After the captivity of Babylon, Nehemiah, the chief of the Jewish nation, abolished debts, Lycurgus abolished debts, Solon abolished debts. The Roman people, after the expulsion of the kings until the accession of the Caesars, struggled with the Senate for the abolition of debts. Afterwards, towards the end of the Republic, and long after the establishment of the Empire, agriculture being abandoned, and the provinces becoming depopulated in consequence of the excessive rates of interest. The emperors freely granted the lands to whoever would cultivate them, that is, they abolished debts. No one, except Lycurgus, who went to the other extreme, ever perceived that the great point was, not to release debtors by a coup d'état, but to prevent the contraction of debts in future. On the contrary, the most democratic governments were always exclusively based upon individual property, so that the social element of all these republics was war between the citizens. Solon decreed that a census should be taken of all fortunes, regulated political rights by the result, granted to the larger proprietors more influence, established the balance of powers, in a word. Inserted in the constitution the most active leaven of discord. As if, instead of a legislator chosen by the people, he had been their greatest enemy. Is it not, indeed, the height of imprudence to grant equality of political rights to men of unequal conditions? If a manufacturer, uniting all his workmen in a joint stock company, should give to each of them a consultative and deliberative voice, that is, should make all of them masters, would this equality of mastership secure continued inequality of wages? That is the whole political system of Solon, reduced to its simplest expression. In giving property a just preponderance, says M. Pastoret, Solon repaired, as far as he was able, his first official act, the abolition of debts. He thought he owed it to public peace to make this great sacrifice of acquired rights and natural equity. But the violation of individual property and written contracts is a bad preface to a public code. In fact, such violations are always cruelly punished. In 89 and 93, the possessions of the nobility and the clergy were confiscated, the clever proletaires were enriched. And today the latter, having become aristocrats, are making us pay dearly for our fathers' robbery. What, therefore, is to be done now? It is not for us to violate right, but to restore it. Now, it would be a violation of justice to dispossess some and endow others, and then stop there. We must gradually lower the rate of interest, organize industry, associate laborers, and their functions, and take a census of the large fortunes, not for the purpose of granting privileges but that we may effect their redemption by settling a life annuity upon their proprietors. We must apply on a large scale the principle of collective production, give the state eminent domain over all capital, make each producer responsible, abolish the custom house, and transform every profession and trade into a public function. Thereby large fortunes will vanish without confiscation or violence, individual possession will establish itself, without communism, under the inspection of the republic. And equality of conditions will no longer depend simply on the will of citizens. Of the authors who have written upon the Romans, Bossuet and Montesquieu occupy prominent positions in the first rank. The first being generally regarded as the father of the philosophy of history, and the second as the most profound writer upon law and politics. Nevertheless, it could be shown that these two great writers, each of them imbued with the prejudices of their century and their cloth, 
have left the question of the causes of the rise and fall of the Romans precisely where they found it. Bossuet is admirable as long as he confines himself to description, witness, among other passages, the picture which he has given us of Greece before the Persian War, and which seems to have inspired Telemachus. The parallel between Athens and Sparta, drawn twenty times since Bossuet, the description of the character and morals of the ancient Romans, and, finally, the sublime peroration which ends the discourse on universal history. But when the famous historian deals with causes, his philosophy is at fault. The tribunes always favored the division of captured lands, or the proceeds of their sale, among the citizens. The Senate steadfastly opposed those laws which were damaging to the state, and wanted the price of lands to be awarded to the public treasury. Thus, according to Bossuet, the first and greatest wrong of civil wars was inflicted upon the people, who, dying of hunger, demanded that the lands, which they had shed their blood to conquer, should be given to them for cultivation. The patricians, who bought them to deliver to their slaves, had more regard for justice and the public interests. How little affects the opinions of men! If the roles of Cicero and the Gracchi had been inverted, Bossuet, whose sympathies were aroused by the eloquence of the great orator more than by the clamors of the tribunes, would have viewed the agrarian laws in quite a different light. He then would have understood that the interest of the treasury was only a pretext. That, when the captured lands were put up at auction, the patricians hastened to buy them, in order to profit by the revenues from them, certain, moreover, that the price paid would come back to them sooner or later. In exchange either for supplies furnished by them to the Republic, or for the subsistence of the multitude, who could buy only of them, and whose services at one time, and poverty at another, were rewarded by the state. For a state does not hoard, on the contrary, the public funds always return to the people. If, then, a certain number of men are the sole dealers in articles of primary necessity, it follows that the public treasury, in passing and repassing through their hands, deposits and accumulates real property there. When Menenius related to the people his fable of the limbs and the stomach, if anyone had remarked to this storyteller that the stomach freely gives to the limbs the nourishment which it freely receives. But that the patricians gave to the plebeians only for cash, and lent to them only at usury, he undoubtedly would have silenced the wily senator, and saved the people from a great imposition. The conscript fathers were fathers only of their own line. As for the common people, they were regarded as an impure race, exploitable, taxable, and workable at the discretion and mercy of their masters. As a general thing, Bossuet shows little regard for the people. His monarchical and theological instincts know nothing but authority, obedience, and almsgiving, under the name of charity. This unfortunate disposition constantly leads him to mistake symptoms for causes, and his depth, which is so much admired, is borrowed from his authors, and amounts to very little, after all. When he says, for instance, that, the dissensions in the Republic, and finally its fall, were caused by the jealousies of its citizens, and their love of liberty carried to an extreme and intolerable extent. Are we not tempted to ask him what caused those jealousies? What inspired the people with that love of liberty, extreme and intolerable? It would be useless to reply, the corruption of morals, the disregard for the ancient poverty, the debaucheries, luxury, and class jealousies. The seditious character of the Gracchi, etc. Why did the morals become corrupt, and whence arose those eternal dissensions between the patricians and the plebeians? In Rome, as in all other places, the dissension between the rich and the poor was not caused directly by the desire for wealth, people, as a general thing, do not covet that which they deem it illegitimate to acquire. But by a natural instinct of the plebeians, which led them to seek the cause of their adversity in the constitution of the Republic. So we are doing today, instead of altering our public economy, we demand an electoral reform. The Roman people wished to return to the social compact, they asked for reforms, and demanded a revision of the laws, and a creation of new magistracies. The patricians, who had nothing to complain of, opposed every innovation. Wealth always has been conservative. Nevertheless, the people overcame the resistance of the Senate, the electoral right was greatly extended. The privileges of the plebeians were increased, they had their representatives, their tribunes, and their consuls, but, 
notwithstanding these reforms, the Republic could not be saved. When all political expedients had been exhausted, when civil war had depleted the population, when the Caesars had thrown their bloody mantle over the cancer which was consuming the empire, inasmuch as accumulated property always was respected. And since the fire never stopped, the nation had to perish in the flames. The imperial power was a compromise which protected the property of the rich and nourished the proletaires with wheat from Africa and Sicily, a double error, which destroyed the aristocrats by plethora and the commoners by famine. At last there was but one real proprietor left, the emperor, whose dependent, flatterer, parasite, or slave, each citizen became. And when this proprietor was ruined, those who gathered the crumbs from under his table, and laughed when he cracked his jokes, perished also. Montesquieu succeeded no better than Bossuet in fathoming the causes of the Roman decline. Indeed, it may be said that the president has only developed the ideas of the bishop. If the Romans had been more moderate in their conquests, more just to their allies, more humane to the vanquished. If the nobles had been less covetous, the emperors less lawless, the people less violent, and all classes less corrupt, if, etc., perhaps the dignity of the empire might have been preserved, and Rome might have retained the scepter of the world. That is all that can be gathered from the teachings of Montesquieu. But the truth of history does not lie there, the destinies of the world are not dependent upon such trivial causes. The passions of men, like the contingencies of time and the varieties of climate, serve to maintain the forces which move humanity and produce all historical changes, but they do not explain them. The grain of sand of which Pascal speaks would have caused the death of one man only, had not prior action ordered the events of which this death was the precursor. Montesquieu has read extensively. He knows Roman history thoroughly, is perfectly well acquainted with the people of whom he speaks, and sees very clearly why they were able to conquer their rivals and govern the world. While reading him we admire the Romans, but we do not like them, we witness their triumphs without pleasure, and we watch their fall without sorrow. Montesquieu's work, like the works of all French writers, is skillfully composed, spirited, witty, and filled with wise observations. He pleases, interests, instructs, but leads to little reflection, he does not conquer by depth of thought. He does not exalt the mind by elevated reason or earnest feeling. In vain should we search his writings for knowledge of antiquity, the character of primitive society, or a description of the heroic ages, whose morals and prejudices lived until the last days of the Republic. Vico, painting the Romans with their horrible traits, represents them as excusable, because he shows that all their conduct was governed by pre-existing ideas and customs, and that they were informed, so to speak, by a superior genius of which they were unconscious. In Montesquieu, the Roman atrocity revolts, but is not explained. Therefore, as a writer, Montesquieu brings greater credit upon French literature, as a philosopher, Vico bears away the palm. Originally, property in Rome was national, not private. Numa was the first to establish individual property by distributing the lands captured by Romulus. What was the dividend of this distribution effected by Numa? What conditions were imposed upon individuals, what powers reserved to the state? None whatever. Inequality of fortunes, absolute abdication by the republic of its right of eminent domain over the property of citizens, such were the first results of the division of Numa, who justly may be regarded as the originator of Roman revolutions. He it was who instituted the worship of the god Terminus, the guardian of private possession, and one of the most ancient gods of Italy. It was Numa who placed property under the protection of Jupiter. Who, in imitation of the Etrurians, wished to make priests of the land surveyors, who invented a liturgy for cadastral operations, and ceremonies of consecration for the marking of boundaries, who, in short, made a religion of property. Fifty-five all these fancies would have been more beneficial than dangerous, if the holy king had not forgotten one essential thing, namely, to fix the amount that each citizen could possess, and on what conditions he could possess it. For, since it is the essence of property to continually increase by accession and profit, and since the lender will take advantage of every opportunity to apply this principle inherent in property, it follows that properties tend 
by means of their natural energy and the religious respect which protects them, to absorb each other, and fortunes to increase or diminish to an indefinite extent, a process which necessarily results in the ruin of the people. And the fall of the Republic. Roman history is but the development of this law. Scarcely had the Tarquins been banished from Rome and the monarchy abolished, when quarrels commenced between the orders. In the year 494 BC, the secession of the commonalty to the Mons Caesar led to the establishment of the tribunate. Of what did the plebeians complain? That they were poor, exhausted by the interest which they paid to the proprietors, Fina Toribus. That the republic, administered for the benefit of the nobles, did nothing for the people. That, delivered over to the mercy of their creditors, who could sell them and their children, and having neither hearth nor home, they were refused the means of subsistence, while the rate of interest was kept at its highest point, etc. For five centuries, the sole policy of the Senate was to evade these just complaints. And, notwithstanding the energy of the tribunes, notwithstanding the eloquence of the Gracchi, the violence of Marius, and the triumph of Caesar, this execrable policy succeeded only too well. The Senate always temporized. The measures proposed by the tribunes might be good, but they were inopportune. It admitted that something should be done. But first it was necessary that the people should resume the performance of their duties, because the Senate could not yield to violence, and force must be employed only by the law. If the people, out of respect for legality, took this beautiful advice, the Senate conjured up a difficulty, the reform was postponed, and that was the end of it. On the contrary, if the demands of the proletaires became too pressing, it declared a foreign war, and neighboring nations were deprived of their liberty, to maintain the Roman aristocracy. But the toils of war were only a halt for the plebeians in their onward march towards pauperism. The lands confiscated from the conquered nations were immediately added to the domain of the state, to the agar publicus. And, as such, cultivated for the benefit of the treasury, or, as was more often the case, they were sold at auction. None of them were granted to the proletaires, who, unlike the patricians and knights, were not supplied by the victory with the means of buying them. War never enriched the soldier, the extensive plundering has been done always by the generals. The vans of Augaro, and of twenty others, are famous in our armies, but no one ever heard of a private getting rich. Nothing was more common in Rome than charges of peculation, extortion, embezzlement, and brigandage, carried on in the provinces at the head of armies, and in other public capacities. All these charges were quieted by intrigue, bribery of the judges, or desistance of the accuser. The culprit was allowed always in the end to enjoy his spoils in peace, his son was only the more respected on account of his father's crimes. And, in fact, it could not be otherwise. What would become of us, if every deputy, peer, or public functionary should be called upon to show his title to his fortune? The patricians arrogated the exclusive enjoyment of the agar publicus. And, like the feudal seigneurs, granted some portions of their lands to their dependents, a wholly precarious concession, revocable at the will of the grantor. The plebeians, on the contrary, were entitled to the enjoyment of only a little pasture land left to them in common, an utterly unjust state of things, since, in consequence of it, taxation, census, weighed more heavily upon the poor than upon the rich. The patrician, in fact, always exempted himself from the tithe which he owed as the price and as the acknowledgment of the concession of domain. And, on the other hand, paid no taxes on his possessions, if, as there is good reason to believe, only citizens' property was taxed. Laboulet, History of Property In order thoroughly to understand the preceding quotation, we must know that the estates of citizens, that is, estates independent of the public domain, whether they were obtained in the division of Numa, or had since been sold by the questors, were alone regarded as property. Upon these attacks, or cents, was imposed. On the contrary, the estates obtained by concessions of the public domain, of the agar publicus, for which a light rent was paid, were called possessions. Thus, among the Romans, there was a right of property and a right of possession regulating the administration of all estates. Now, what did the proletaires wish? That the just possessionees, 
the simple right of possession, should be extended to them at the expense, as is evident, not of private property, but of the public domain, agri publici. The proletaires, in short, demanded that they should be tenants of the land which they had conquered. This demand, the patricians in their avarice never would accede to. Buying as much of this land as they could, they afterwards found means of obtaining the rest as possessions. Upon this land they employed their slaves. The people, who could not buy, on account of the competition of the rich, nor hire, because, cultivating with their own hands, they could not promise a rent equal to the revenue which the land would yield when cultivated by slaves, were always deprived of possession and property. Civil wars relieved, to some extent, the sufferings of the multitude. The people enrolled themselves under the banners of the ambitious, in order to obtain by force that which the law refused them, property. A colony was the reward of a victorious legion. But it was no longer the Agar publicus only, it was all Italy that lay at the mercy of the legions. The Agar publicus disappeared almost entirely, but the cause of the evil, accumulated property, became more potent than ever. Laboule, History of Property The author whom I quote does not tell us why this division of territory which followed civil wars did not arrest the encroachments of accumulated property, the omission is easily supplied. Land is not the only requisite for cultivation. A working stock is also necessary, animals, tools, harnesses, a house, an advance, etc. Where did the colonists, discharged by the dictator who rewarded them, obtain these things? From the purse of the usurers. That is, of the patricians, to whom all these lands finally returned, in consequence of the rapid increase of usury, and the seizure of estates. Sallust, in his account of the conspiracy of Catalan, tells us of this fact. The conspirators were old soldiers of Scylla, who, as a reward for their services, had received from him lands in Cisalpine Gaul, Tuscany, and other parts of the peninsula. Less than twenty years had elapsed since these colonists, free of debt, had left the service and commenced farming, and already they were crippled by usury, and almost ruined. The poverty caused by the exactions of creditors was the life of this conspiracy which well nigh inflamed all Italy, and which, with a worthier chief and fairer means, possibly would have succeeded. In Rome, the mass of the people were favorable to the conspirators, cuncta plebes Catalani and septa probabat, the allies were weary of the patricians' robberies. Deputies from the Allobroges, the Savoyards, had come to Rome to appeal to the Senate in behalf of their fellow citizens involved in debt, in short, the complaint against the large proprietors was universal. We call men and gods to witness, said the soldiers of Catalan, who were Roman citizens with not a slave among them, that we have taken arms neither against the country, nor to attack anyone, but in defense of our lives and liberties. Wretched, poor, most of us deprived of country, all of us of fame and fortune, by the violence and cruelty of usurers, we have no rights, no property, no liberty. 56. The bad reputation of Catalan, and his atrocious designs, the imprudence of his accomplices, the treason of several, the strategy of Cicero, the angry outbursts of Cato, and the terror of the Senate, baffled this enterprise, which, in furnishing a precedent for expeditions against the rich, would perhaps have saved the Republic, and given peace to the world. But Rome could not evade her destiny, the end of her expiations had not come. A nation never was known to anticipate its punishment by a sudden and unexpected conversion. Now, the long-continued crimes of the Eternal City could not be atoned for by the massacre of a few hundred patricians. Catalan came to stay divine vengeance, therefore his conspiracy failed. The encroachment of large proprietors upon small proprietors, by the aid of usury, farm rent, and profits of all sorts, was common throughout the empire. The most honest citizens invested their money at high rates of interest. 57 Cato, Cicero, Brutus, all the Stoics so noted for their frugality, Viri Frigi, Seneca, the teacher of virtue, levied enormous taxes in the provinces, under the name of usury. And it is something remarkable, that the last defenders of the Republic, the proud Pompeys, were all usurious aristocrats, and oppressors of the poor. But the Battle of Pharsalus, having killed men only, 
without touching institutions, the encroachments of the large domains became every day more active. Ever since the birth of Christianity, the fathers have opposed this invasion with all their might. Their writings are filled with burning curses upon this crime of usury, of which Christians are not always innocent. St. Cyprian complains of certain bishops of his time, who, absorbed in disgraceful stock-jobbing operations, abandoned their churches, and went about the provinces appropriating lands by artifice and fraud. While lending money and piling up interests upon interests. 58 Why, in the midst of this passion for accumulation, did not the possession of the public land, like private property, become concentrated in a few hands? By law, the domain of the state was inalienable, and consequently possession was always revocable. But the edict of the praetor continued it indefinitely, so that finally the possessions of the patricians were transformed into absolute property, though the name, possessions, was still applied to them. This conversion, instigated by senatorial avarice, owed its accomplishment to the most deplorable and indiscreet policy. If, in the time of Tiberius Gracchus, who wished to limit each citizen's possession of the Ager Publicus to five hundred acres, the amount of this possession had been fixed at as much as one family could cultivate. And granted on the express condition that the possessor should cultivate it himself, and should lease it to no one, the empire never would have been desolated by large estates. And possession, instead of increasing property, would have absorbed it. On what, then, depended the establishment and maintenance of equality in conditions and fortunes? On a more equitable division of the Ager Publicus, a wiser distribution of the right of possession. I insist upon this point, which is of the utmost importance, because it gives us an opportunity to examine the history of this individual possession, of which I said so much in my first memoir. And which so few of my readers seem to have understood. The Roman Republic, having, as it did, the power to dispose absolutely of its territory, and to impose conditions upon possessors, was nearer to liberty and equality than any nation has been since. If the Senate had been intelligent and just, if, at the time of the retreat to the Mon Caesar, instead of the ridiculous farce enacted by Meninius Agrippa, a solemn renunciation of the right to acquire had been made by each citizen on attaining his share of possessions, the Republic, based upon equality of possessions and the duty of labor, would not, in attaining its wealth, have degenerated in morals. Fabricius would have enjoyed the arts without controlling artists, and the conquests of the ancient Romans would have been the means of spreading civilization, instead of the series of murders and robberies that they were. But property, having unlimited power to amass and to lease, was daily increased by the addition of new possessions. From the time of Nero, six individuals were the sole proprietors of one half of Roman Africa. In the fifth century, the wealthy families had incomes of no less than two millions, some possessed as many as twenty thousand slaves. All the authors who have written upon the causes of the fall of the Roman Republic concur. M. Giroux of Ix 59 quotes the testimony of Cicero, Seneca, Plutarch, Olympiodorus, and Photius. Under Vespasian and Titus, Pliny, the naturalist, exclaimed, Large estates have ruined Italy, and are ruining the provinces. But it never has been understood that the extension of property was effected then, as it is today, under the aegis of the law, and by virtue of the Constitution. When the Senate sold captured lands at auction, it was in the interest of the treasury and of public welfare. When the patricians bought up possessions and property, they realized the purpose of the Senate's decrees. When they lent at high rates of interest, they took advantage of a legal privilege. Property, said the lender, is the right to enjoy even to the extent of abuse, jus utendi ed abutendi. That is, the right to lend at interest, to lease, to acquire, and then to lease and lend again. But property is also the right to exchange, to transfer, and to sell. If, then, the social condition is such that the proprietor, ruined by usury, may be compelled to sell his possession, the means of his subsistence, he will sell it. And, thanks to the law, accumulated property, devouring and anthropophagous property, will be established. 60. The immediate and secondary cause of the decline of the Romans was, then, the internal dissensions between the two orders of the Republic, 
the patricians and the plebeians, dissensions which gave rise to civil wars, proscriptions, and loss of liberty, and finally led to the empire. But the primary and mediate cause of their decline was the establishment by Numa of the institution of property. I end with an extract from a work which I have quoted several times already, and which has recently received a prize from the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. The concentration of property, says M. Laboulay, while causing extreme poverty, forced the emperors to feed and amuse the people, that they might forget their misery. Panem et circensis, that was the Roman law in regard to the poor. A dire and perhaps a necessary evil wherever a landed aristocracy exists. To feed these hungry mouths, grain was brought from Africa and the provinces, and distributed gratuitously among the needy. In the time of Caesar, 320,000 people were thus fed. Augustus saw that such a measure led directly to the destruction of husbandry. But to abolish these distributions was to put a weapon within the reach of the first aspirant for power. The emperor shrank at the thought. While grain was gratuitous, agriculture was impossible. Tillage gave way to pasturage, another cause of depopulation, even among slaves. Finally, luxury, carried further and further every day, covered the soil of Italy with elegant villas, which occupied whole cantons. Gardens and groves replaced the fields, and the free population fled to the towns. Husbandry disappeared almost entirely, and with husbandry the husbandmen. Africa furnished the wheat, and Greece the wine. Tiberius complained bitterly of this evil, which placed the lives of the Roman people at the mercy of the winds and waves, that was his anxiety. One day later, and three hundred thousand starving men walked the streets of Rome, that was a revolution. This decline of Italy and the provinces did not stop. After the reign of Nero, depopulation commenced in towns as noted as Antium and Tarentum. Under the reign of Pertinax, there was so much desert land that the emperor abandoned it, even that which belonged to the treasury, to whoever would cultivate it, besides exempting the farmers from taxation for a period of ten years. Senators were compelled to invest one-third of their fortunes in real estate in Italy, but this measure served only to increase the evil which they wished to cure. To force the rich to possess in Italy was to increase the large estates which had ruined the country. And must I say, finally, that Aurelian wished to send the captives into the desert lands of Etruria, and that Valentinian was forced to settle the Alamanni on the fertile banks of the Po. If the reader, in running through this book, should complain of meeting with nothing but quotations from other works, extracts from journals and public lectures, comments upon laws, and interpretations of them. I would remind him that the very object of this memoir is to establish the conformity of my opinion concerning property with that universally held. That, far from aiming at a paradox, it has been my main study to follow the advice of the world, and, finally, that my sole pretension is to clearly formulate the general belief. I cannot repeat it too often, and I confess it with pride, I teach absolutely nothing that is new, and I should regard the doctrine which I advocate as radically erroneous, if a single witness should testify against it. Let us now trace the revolutions in property among the barbarians. As long as the German tribes dwelt in their forests, it did not occur to them to divide and appropriate the soil. The land was held in common, each individual could plow, sow, and reap. But, when the empire was once invaded, they bethought themselves of sharing the land, just as they shared spoils after a victory. Hence, says M. Laboulay, the expression sorts Burgundiorum Gotharum and Capilamda Aetero Omicron Iota Omicron Upsilon Alpha Nu Delta Iota Lambda Omega Nu, hence the German words Allod, Allodium, and Luce, Lot, which are used in all modern languages to designate the gifts of chance. Allodial property, at least with the mass of coparsoners, was originally held, then, in equal shares, for all of the prizes were equal, or, at least, equivalent. This property, like that of the Romans, was wholly individual, independent, exclusive, transferable, and consequently susceptible of accumulation and invasion. But, instead of its being, as was the case among the Romans, the large estate which, through increase and usury, subordinated and absorbed the small one, among the barbarians, 
fonder of war than of wealth. More eager to dispose of persons than to appropriate things, it was the warrior who, through superiority of arms, enslaved his adversary. The Roman wanted matter, the barbarian wanted man. Consequently, in the feudal ages, rents were almost nothing, simply a hare, a partridge, a pie, a few pints of wine brought by a little girl, or a maypole set up within the suzerain's reach. In return, the vassal or incumbent had to follow the seigneur to battle, a thing which happened almost every day, and equip and feed himself at his own expense. This spirit of the German tribes, this spirit of companionship and association, governed the territory as it governed individuals. The lands, like the men, were secured to a chief or seigneur by a bond of mutual protection and fidelity. This subjection was the labor of the German epoch which gave birth to feudalism. By fair means or foul, every proprietor who could not be a chief was forced to be a vassal. Laboulet, History of Property By fair means or foul, every mechanic who cannot be a master has to be a journeyman, every proprietor who is not an invader will be invaded. Every producer who cannot, by the exploitation of other men, furnish products at less than their proper value, will lose his labor. Corporations and masterships, which are hated so bitterly, but which will reappear if we are not careful, are the necessary results of the principle of competition which is inherent in property. Their organization was patterned formerly after that of the feudal hierarchy, which was the result of the subordination of men and possessions. The times which paved the way for the advent of feudalism and the reappearance of large proprietors were times of carnage and the most frightful anarchy. Never before had murder and violence made such havoc with the human race. The tenth century, among others, if my memory serves me rightly, was called the century of iron. His property, his life, and the honor of his wife and children always in danger, the small proprietor made haste to do homage to his seigneur, and to bestow something on the church of his freehold, that he might receive protection and security. Both facts and laws bear witness that from the sixth to the tenth century the proprietors of small freeholds were gradually plundered or reduced by the encroachments of large proprietors and counts to the condition of either vassals or tributaries. The capitularies are full of repressive provisions, but the incessant reiteration of these threats only shows the perseverance of the evil and the impotency of the government. Oppression, moreover, varies but little in its methods. The complaints of the free proprietors, and the groans of the plebeians at the time of the Gracchi, were one and the same. It is said that, Whenever a poor man refused to give his estate to the bishop, the curate, the count, the judge, or the centurion, these immediately sought an opportunity to ruin him. They made him serve in the army until, completely ruined, he was induced, by fair means or foul, to give up his freehold. Labelle, History of Property How many small proprietors and manufacturers have not been ruined by large ones through chicanery, lawsuits, and competition? Strategy, violence, and usury, such are the proprietor's methods of plundering the laborer. Thus we see property, at all ages and in all its forms, oscillating by virtue of its principle between two opposite terms, extreme division and extreme accumulation. Property, at its first term, is almost null. Reduced to personal exploitation, it is property only potentially. At its second term, it exists in its perfection, then it is truly property. When property is widely distributed, society thrives, progresses, grows, and rises quickly to the zenith of its power. Thus, the Jews, after leaving Babylon with Esdras and Nehemiah, soon became richer and more powerful than they had been under their kings. Sparta was in a strong and prosperous condition during the two or three centuries which followed the death of Lycurgus. The best days of Athens were those of the Persian War. Rome, whose inhabitants were divided from the beginning into two classes, the exploiters and the exploited, knew no such thing as peace. When property is concentrated, society, abusing itself, polluted, so to speak, grows corrupt, wears itself out, how shall I express this horrible idea? Plunges into long-continued and fatal luxury. When feudalism was established, society had to die of the same disease which killed it under the Caesars, I mean accumulated property. But humanity, 
created for an immortal destiny, is deathless. The revolutions which disturb it are purifying crises, invariably followed by more vigorous health. In the 5th century, the invasion of the barbarians partially restored the world to a state of natural equality. In the 12th century, a new spirit pervading all society gave the slave his rights, and through justice breathed new life into the heart of nations. It has been said, and often repeated, that Christianity regenerated the world. That is true. But it seems to me that there is a mistake in the date. Christianity had no influence upon Roman society, when the barbarians came, that society had disappeared. For such is God's curse upon property. Every political organization based upon the exploitation of man shall perish, slave labor is death to the race of tyrants. The patrician families became extinct, as the feudal families did, and as all aristocracies must. It was in the Middle Ages, when a reactionary movement was beginning to secretly undermine accumulated property, that the influence of Christianity was first exercised to its full extent. The destruction of feudalism, the conversion of the serf into the commoner, the emancipation of the communes, and the admission of the third estate to political power, were deeds accomplished by Christianity exclusively. I say Christianity, not ecclesiasticism, for the priests and bishops were themselves large proprietors, and as such often persecuted the villains. Without the Christianity of the Middle Ages, the existence of modern society could not be explained, and would not be possible. The truth of this assertion is shown by the very facts which M. Laboulay quotes, although this author inclines to the opposite opinion. Point 61. 1. Slavery among the Romans. The Roman slave was, in the eyes of the law, only a thing, no more than an ox or a horse. He had neither property, family, nor personality. He was defenseless against his master's cruelty, folly, or cupidity. Sell your oxen that are past use, said Cato, sell your calves, your lambs, your wool, your hides, your old plows, your old iron, your old slave, and your sick slave, and all that is of no use to you. When no market could be found for the slaves that were worn out by sickness or old age, they were abandoned to starvation. Claudius was the first defender of this shameful practice. Discharge your old workman, says the economist of the proprietary school, turn off that sick domestic, that toothless and worn-out servant. Put away the unserviceable beauty, to the hospital with the useless mouths. The condition of these wretched beings improved but little under the emperors, and the best that can be said of the goodness of Antoninus is that he prohibited intolerable cruelty, as an abuse of property. Expedit enim rea publici ne cas re sua male utater, says Gaius. As soon as the church met in council, it launched an anathema against the masters who had exercised over their slaves this terrible right of life and death. Were not the slaves, thanks to the right of sanctuary and to their poverty, the dearest protégés of religion? Constantine, who embodied in the laws the grand ideas of Christianity, valued the life of a slave as highly as that of a freeman, and declared the master, who had intentionally brought death upon his slave, guilty of murder. Between this law and that of Antoninus there is a complete revolution in moral ideas, the slave was a thing, religion has made him a man. Note the last words, between the law of the gospel and that of Antoninus there is a complete revolution in moral ideas, the slave was a thing, religion has made him a man. The moral revolution which transformed the slave into a citizen was effected, then, by Christianity before the barbarians set foot upon the soil of the empire. We have only to trace the progress of this moral revolution in the personnel of society. But, M. Laboulay rightly says, it did not change the condition of men in a moment, any more than that of things, between slavery and liberty there was an abyss which could not be filled in a day, the transitional step was servitude. Now, what was servitude? In what did it differ from Roman slavery, and whence came this difference? Let the same author answer. 2 of servitude. I see, in the Lord's manner, slaves charged with domestic duties. Some are employed in the personal service of the master, others are charged with household cares. The women spin the wool. The men grind the grain, make the bread, or practice, in the interest of the seigneur, 
what little they know of the industrial arts. The master punishes them when he chooses, kills them with impunity, and sells them and there's like so many cattle. The slave has no personality, and consequently no wergeld 62 peculiar to himself, he is a thing. The wergeld belongs to the master as a compensation for the loss of his property. Whether the slave is killed or stolen, the indemnity does not change, for the injury is the same, but the indemnity increases or diminishes according to the value of the serf. In all these particulars Germanic slavery and Roman servitude are alike. This similarity is worthy of notice. Slavery is always the same, whether in a Roman villa or on a barbarian farm. The man, like the ox and the ass, is a part of the livestock, a price is set upon his head. He is a tool without a conscience, a chattel without personality, an impeccable, irresponsible being, who has neither rights nor duties. Why did his condition improve? In good season, when the serf began to be regarded as a man. And, as such, the law of the Visigoths, under the influence of Christian ideas, punished with fine or banishment anyone who maimed or killed him. Always Christianity, always religion, though we should like to speak of the laws only. Did the philanthropy of the Visigoths make its first appearance before or after the preaching of the Gospel? This point must be cleared up. After the conquest, the serfs were scattered over the large estates of the barbarians, each having his house, his lot, and his peculium, in return for which he paid rent and performed service. They were rarely separated from their homes when their land was sold, they and all that they had became the property of the purchaser. The law favored this realization of the serf, in not allowing him to be sold out of the country. What inspired this law, destructive not only of slavery, but of property itself? For, if the master cannot drive from his domain the slave whom he has once established there, it follows that the slave is proprietor, as well as the master. The barbarians, again says M. Flabolet, were the first to recognize the slave's rights of family and property, two rights which are incompatible with slavery. But was this recognition the necessary result of the mode of servitude in vogue among the Germanic nations previous to their conversion to Christianity, or was it the immediate effect of that spirit of justice infused with religion? By which the Seigneur was forced to respect in the serf a soul equal to his own, a brother in Jesus Christ, purified by the same baptism, and redeemed by the same sacrifice of the Son of God in the form of man. For we must not close our eyes to the fact that, though the barbarian morals and the ignorance and carelessness of the seigneurs, who busied themselves mainly with wars and battles, paying little or no attention to agriculture, may have been great aids in the emancipation of the serfs, still the vital principle of this emancipation was essentially Christian. Suppose that the barbarians had remained pagans in the midst of a pagan world. As they did not change the gospel, so they would not have changed the polytheistic customs, slavery would have remained what it was. They would have continued to kill the slaves who were desirous of liberty, family, and property, whole nations would have been reduced to the condition of helots, nothing would have changed upon the terrestrial stage, except the actors. The barbarians were less selfish, less imperious, less dissolute, and less cruel than the Romans. Such was the nature upon which, after the fall of the empire and the renovation of society, Christianity was to act. But this nature, grounded as in former times upon slavery and war, would, by its own energy, have produced nothing but war and slavery. Gradually the serfs obtained the privilege of being judged by the same standard as their masters. When, how, and by what title did they obtain this privilege? Gradually their duties were regulated. Whence came the regulations? Who had the authority to introduce them? The master took a part of the labor of the serf, three days, for instance, and left the rest to him. As for Sunday, that belonged to God. And what established Sunday, if not religion? Whence I infer, that the same power which took it upon itself to suspend hostilities and to lighten the duties of the serf was also that which regulated the judiciary and created a sort of law for the slave. But this law itself, on what did it bear? What was its principle? What was the philosophy of the councils and popes with reference to this matter? The reply to all these questions, coming from me alone, would be distrusted. 
the authority of M. Labelle shall give credence to my words. This holy philosophy, to which the slaves were indebted for everything, this invocation of the gospel, was an anathema against property. The proprietors of small freeholds, that is, the freemen of the middle class, had fallen, in consequence of the tyranny of the nobles, into a worse condition than that of the tenants and serfs. The expenses of war weighed less heavily upon the serf than upon the freemen, and, as for legal protection, the seigneurial court, where the serf was judged by his peers, was far preferable to the cantonal assembly. It was better to have a noble for a seigneur than for a judge. So it is better today to have a man of large capital for an associate than for a rival. The honest tenant, the laborer who earns weekly a moderate but constant salary, is more to be envied than the independent but small farmer, or the poor licensed mechanic. At that time, all were either seigneurs or serfs, oppressors or oppressed. Then, under the protection of convents, or of the seigneurial turret, new societies were formed, which silently spread over the soil made fertile by their hands. And which derived their power from the annihilation of the free classes whom they enlisted in their behalf. As tenants, these men acquired, from generation to generation, sacred rights over the soil which they cultivated in the interest of lazy and pillaging masters. As fast as the social tempest abetted, it became necessary to respect the union and heritage of these villains, who by their labor had truly prescribed the soil for their own profit. I ask how prescription could take effect ere a contrary title and possession already existed. M. Laboule is a lawyer. Where, then, did he ever see the labor of the slave and the cultivation by the tenant prescribe the soil for their own profit, to the detriment of a recognized master daily acting as a proprietor? Let us not disguise matters. As fast as the tenants and the serfs grew rich, they wished to be independent and free, they commenced to associate, unfurl their municipal banners, raise belfries, fortify their towns, and refuse to pay their seigneurial dues. In doing these things they were perfectly right, for, in fact, their condition was intolerable. But in law, I mean in Roman and Napoleonic law, their refusal to obey and pay tribute to their masters was illegitimate. Now, this imperceptible usurpation of property by the commonalty was inspired by religion. The seigneur had attached the serf to the soil, religion granted the serf rights over the soil. The seigneur imposed duties upon the serf. Religion fixed their limits. The seigneur could kill the serf with impunity, could deprive him of his wife, violate his daughter, pillage his house, and rob him of his savings, religion checked his invasions, it excommunicated the seigneur. Religion was the real cause of the ruin of feudal property. Why should it not be bold enough today to resolutely condemn capitalistic property? Since the Middle Ages, there has been no change in social economy except in its forms. Its relations remain unaltered. The only result of the emancipation of the serfs was that property changed hands, or, rather, that new proprietors were created. Sooner or later the extension of privilege, far from curing the evil, was to operate to the disadvantage of the plebeians. Nevertheless, the new social organization did not meet with the same end in all places. In Lombardy, for example, where the people rapidly growing rich through commerce and industry soon conquered the authorities, even to the exclusion of the nobles, first, the nobility became poor and degraded, and were forced. In order to live and maintain their credit, to gain admission to the guilds. Then, the ordinary subalternization of property leading to inequality of fortunes, to wealth and poverty, to jealousies and hatreds, the cities passed rapidly from the rancorous democracy under the yoke of a few ambitious leaders. Such was the fate of most of the Lombardic cities, Genoa, Florence, Bologna, Milan, Pisa, etc., which afterwards changed rulers frequently, but which have never since risen in favor of liberty. The people can easily escape from the tyranny of despots, but they do not know how to throw off the effects of their own despotism, just as we avoid the assassin's steel, while we succumb to a constitutional malady. As soon as a nation becomes proprietor, either it must perish, or a foreign invasion must force it again to begin its evolutionary round. Point 63. In France, the revolution was much more gradual. 
The communes, in taking refuge under the protection of the kings, had found them masters rather than protectors. Their liberty had long since been lost, or, rather, their emancipation had been suspended, when feudalism received its death blow at the hand of Richelieu. Then liberty halted, the prince of the feudatories held sole and undivided sway. The nobles, the clergy, the commoners, the parliaments, everything in short except a few seeming privileges, were controlled by the king. Who, like his early predecessors, consumed regularly, and nearly always in advance, the revenues of his domain, and that domain was France. Finally, 89 arrived, liberty resumed its march. A century and a half had been required to wear out the last form of feudal property, monarchy. The French Revolution may be defined as the substitution of real right for personal right. That is to say, in the days of feudalism, the value of property depended upon the standing of the proprietor, while, after the revolution, the regard for the man was proportional to his property. Now, we have seen from what has been said in the preceding pages, that this recognition of the right of laborers had been the constant aim of the serfs and communes, the secret motive of their efforts. The movement of 89 was only the last stage of that long insurrection. But it seems to me that we have not paid sufficient attention to the fact that the revolution of 1789, instigated by the same causes, animated by the same spirit, triumphing by the same struggles, was consummated in Italy four centuries ago. Italy was the first to sound the signal of war against feudalism, France has followed, Spain and England are beginning to move, the rest still sleep. If a grand example should be given to the world, the day of trial would be much abridged. Note the following summary of the revolutions of property, from the days of the Roman Empire down to the present time. 1. 5th century. Barbarian invasions, division of the lands of the empire into independent portions or freeholds. 2. From the 5th to the 8th century. Gradual concentration of freeholds, or transformation of the small freeholds into fiefs, feuds, tenures, etc. Large properties, small possessions. Charlemagne, 771, 814, decrees that all freeholds are dependent upon the King of France. 3. From the 8th to the 10th century. The relation between the crown and the superior dependents is broken. The latter becoming freeholders, while the smaller dependents cease to recognize the king, and adhere to the nearest suzerain. Feudal system. 4. 12th century. Movement of the serfs towards liberty, emancipation of the communes. 5. 13th century. Abolition of personal right, and of the feudal system in Italy. Italian republics. 6. 17th century. Abolition of feudalism in France during Richelieu's ministry. Despotism. 7. 1789. Abolition of all privileges of birth, caste, provinces, and corporations, equality of persons and of rights. French democracy. 8. 1830. The principle of concentration inherent in individual property is remarked. Development of the idea of association. The more we reflect upon this series of transformations and changes, the more clearly we see that they were necessary in their principle, in their manifestations, and in their result. It was necessary that inexperienced conquerors, eager for liberty, should divide the Roman Empire into a multitude of estates, as free and independent as themselves. It was necessary that these men, who liked war even better than liberty, should submit to their leaders, and, as the freehold represented the man, that property should violate property. It was necessary that, under the rule of a nobility always idle when not fighting, there should grow up a body of laborers, who, by the power of production, and by the division and circulation of wealth, would gradually gain control over commerce, industry, and a portion of the land, and who, having become rich, would aspire to power and authority also. It was necessary, finally, that liberty and equality of rights having been achieved, and individual property still existing, attended by robbery, poverty, social inequality, and oppression, there should be an inquiry into the cause of this evil. And an idea of universal association formed, whereby, on condition of labor, all interests should be protected and consolidated. 
Evil, when carried too far, says a learned jurist, cures itself, and the political innovation which aims to increase the power of the state, finally succumbs to the effects of its own work. The Germans, to secure their independence, chose chiefs, and soon they were oppressed by their kings and noblemen. The monarchs surrounded themselves with volunteers, in order to control the freemen. And they found themselves dependent upon their proud vassals. The Missi Dominici were sent into the provinces to maintain the power of the emperors, and to protect the people from the oppressions of the noblemen. And not only did they usurp the imperial power to a great extent, but they dealt more severely with the inhabitants. The freemen became vassals, in order to get rid of military service and court duty. And they were immediately involved in all the personal quarrels of their seigneurs, and compelled to do jury duty in their courts. The kings protected the cities and the communes, in the hope of freeing them from the yoke of the grand vassals, and of rendering their own power more absolute. And those same communes have, in several European countries, procured the establishment of a constitutional power, are now holding royalty in check, and are giving rise to a universal desire for political reform. Meyer, Judicial Institutions of Europe In Recapitulation What was feudalism? A confederation of the grand seigneurs against the villains, and against the king.64 What is constitutional government? A confederation of the bourgeoisie against the laborers, and against the king.65. How did feudalism end? In the union of the communes and the royal authority. How will the bourgeoisie aristocracy end? In the union of the proletariat and the sovereign power. What was the immediate result of the struggle of the communes and the king against the seigneurs? The monarchical unity of Louis XIV. What will be the result of the struggle of the proletariat and the sovereign power combined against the bourgeoisie? The absolute unity of the nation and the government. It remains to be seen whether the nation, one and supreme, will be represented in its executive and central power by one, by five, by one hundred, or one thousand. That is, it remains to be seen, whether the royalty of the barricades intends to maintain itself by the people, or without the people, and whether Louis Philippe wishes his reign to be the most famous in all history. I have made this statement as brief, but at the same time as accurate as I could, neglecting facts and details, that I might give the more attention to the economical relations of society. For the study of history is like the study of the human organism, just as the latter has its system, its organs, and its functions, which can be treated separately, so the former has its ensemble, its instruments, and its causes. Of course I do not pretend that the principle of property is a complete resume of all the social forces. But, as in that wonderful machine which we call our body, the harmony of the whole allows us to draw a general conclusion from the consideration of a single function or organ, so, in discussing historical causes. I have been able to reason with absolute accuracy from a single order of facts, certain as I was of the perfect correlation which exists between this special order and universal history. As is the property of a nation, so is its family, its marriage, its religion, its civil and military organization, and its legislative and judicial institutions. History, viewed from this standpoint, is a grand and sublime psychological study. Well, sir, in writing against property, have I done more than quote the language of history? I have said to modern society, the daughter and heiress of all preceding societies, age good ageis, complete the task which for six thousand years you have been executing under the inspiration and by the command of God, hasten to finish your journey. Turn neither to the right nor the left, but follow the road which lies before you. You seek reason, law, unity, and discipline. But hereafter you can find them only by stripping off the veils of your infancy, and ceasing to follow instinct as a guide. Awaken your sleeping conscience, open your eyes to the pure light of reflection and science. Behold the phantom which troubled your dreams, and so long kept you in a state of unutterable anguish. Know thyself, O long deluded society. Know thy enemy. And I have denounced property. We often hear the defenders of the right of domain quote in defense of their views the testimony of nations and ages. We can judge, from what has just been said, how far this historical argument conforms to the real facts and the conclusions of science. 
To complete this apology, I must examine the various theories. Neither politics, nor legislation, nor history, can be explained and understood, without a positive theory which defines their elements and discovers their laws, in short, without a philosophy. Now, the two principal schools, which to this day divide the attention of the world, do not satisfy this condition. The first, essentially practical in its character, confined to a statement of facts, and buried in learning, cares very little by what laws humanity develops itself. To it these laws are the secret of the Almighty, which no one can fathom without a commission from on high. In applying the facts of history to government, this school does not reason, it does not anticipate. It makes no comparison of the past with the present, in order to predict the future. In its opinion, the lessons of experience teach us only to repeat old errors, and its whole philosophy consists in perpetually retracing the tracks of antiquity, instead of going straight ahead forever in the direction in which they point. The second school may be called either fatalistic or pantheistic. To it the movements of empires and the revolutions of humanity are the manifestations, the incarnations, of the Almighty. The human race, identified with the divine essence, wheels in a circle of appearances, informations, and destructions, which necessarily excludes the idea of absolute truth, and destroys providence and liberty. Corresponding to these two schools of history, there are two schools of jurisprudence, similarly opposed, and possessed of the same peculiarities. 1. The practical and conventional school, to which the law is always a creation of the legislator, an expression of his will, a privilege which he condescends to grant, in short, a gratuitous affirmation to be regarded as judicious and legitimate. No matter what it declares. 2. The fatalistic and pantheistic school, sometimes called the historical school, which opposes the despotism of the first, and maintains that law, like literature and religion, is always the expression of society, its manifestation, its form. The external realization of its mobile spirit and its ever-changing inspirations. Each of these schools, denying the absolute, rejects thereby all positive and a priori philosophy. Now, it is evident that the theories of these two schools, whatever view we take of them, are utterly unsatisfactory, for, opposed, they form no dilemma, that is, if one is false, it does not follow that the other is true. And, united, they do not constitute the truth, since they disregard the absolute, without which there is no truth. They are respectively a thesis and an antithesis. There remains to be found, then, a synthesis, which, predicating the absolute, justifies the will of the legislator, explains the variations of the law, annihilates the theory of the circular movement of humanity, and demonstrates its progress. The legists, by the very nature of their studies and in spite of their obstinate prejudices, have been led irresistibly to suspect that the absolute in the science of law is not as chimerical as is commonly supposed. And this suspicion arose from their comparison of the various relations which legislators have been called upon to regulate. M. Laboulet, the laureate of the Institute, begins his history of property with these words. While the law of contract, which regulates only the mutual interests of men, has not varied for centuries, except in certain forms which relate more to the proof than to the character of the obligation, the civil law of property, which regulates the mutual relations of citizens, has undergone several radical changes, and has kept pace in its variations with all the vicissitudes of society. The law of contract, which holds essentially to those principles of eternal justice which are engraven upon the depths of the human heart, is the immutable element of jurisprudence, and, in a certain sense, its philosophy. Property, on the contrary, is the variable element of jurisprudence, its history, its policy. Marvelous! There is in law, and consequently in politics, something variable and something invariable. The invariable element is obligation, the bond of justice, duty, the variable element is property, that is, the external form of law, the subject matter of the contract. Whence it follows that the law can modify, change, reform, and judge property. Reconcile that, if you can, with the idea of an eternal, absolute, permanent, and indefectible right. However, M. 
Laboulet is in perfect accord with himself when he adds, possession of the soil rests solely upon force until society takes it in hand, and espouses the cause of the possessor. 66 and, a little farther, the right of property is not natural, but social. The laws not only protect property, they give it birth, etc. Now, that which the law has made the law can unmake, especially since, according to M. Laboulet, an avowed partisan of the historical or pantheistic school, the law is not absolute, is not an idea, but a form. But why is it that property is variable, and, unlike obligation, incapable of definition in settlement? Before affirming, somewhat boldly without doubt, that in right there are no absolute principles, the most dangerous, most immoral, most tyrannical, in a word, most antisocial, assertion imaginable. It was proper that the right of property should be subjected to a thorough examination, in order to put in evidence its variable, arbitrary, and contingent elements, and those which are eternal, legitimate, and absolute. Then, this operation performed, it became easy to account for the laws, and to correct all the codes. Now, this examination of property I claim to have made, and in the fullest detail. But, either from the public's lack of interest in an unrecommended and unattractive pamphlet, or, which is more probable, from the weakness of exposition and want of genius which characterized the work, the first memoir on property passed unnoticed. Scarcely would a few communists, having turned its leaves, deign to brand it with their disapprobation. You alone, sir, in spite of the disfavor which I showed for your economical predecessors in too severe a criticism of them, you alone have judged me justly. And although I cannot accept, at least literally, your first judgment, yet it is to you alone that I appeal from a decision too equivocal to be regarded as final. It not being my intention to enter at present into a discussion of principles, I shall content myself with estimating, from the point of view of this simple and intelligible absolute, the theories of property which our generation has produced. The most exact idea of property is given us by the Roman law, faithfully followed in this particular by the ancient legists. It is the absolute, exclusive, autocratic domain of a man over a thing, a domain which begins by use of caption, is maintained by possession, and finally, by the aid of prescription, finds its sanction in the civil law. A domain which so identifies the man with the thing, that the proprietor can say, he who uses my field, virtually compels me to labor for him, therefore he owes me compensation. I pass in silence the secondary modes by which property can be acquired, tradition, sale, exchange, inheritance, etc., which have nothing in common with the origin of property. Accordingly, Pothier said the domain of property, and not simply property. And the most learned writers on jurisprudence, in imitation of the Roman praetor who recognized a right of property and a right of possession, have carefully distinguished between the domain and the right of usufruct, use, and habitation, which, reduced to its natural limits, is the very expression of justice. And which is, in my opinion, to supplant domenial property, and finally form the basis of all jurisprudence. But, sir, admire the clumsiness of systems, or rather the fatality of logic. While the Roman law and all the savants inspired by it teach that property in its origin is the right of first occupancy sanctioned by law, the modern legists, dissatisfied with this brutal definition, claim that property is based upon labor. Immediately they infer that he who no longer labors, but makes another labor in his stead, loses his right to the earnings of the latter. It is by virtue of this principle that the serfs of the Middle Ages claimed a legal right to property, and consequently to the enjoyment of political rights. That the clergy were despoiled in eighty-nine of their immense estates, and were granted a pension in exchange, that at the restoration the liberal deputies opposed the indemnity of one billion francs. The nation, said they, has acquired by twenty-five years of labor and possession the property which the emigrants forfeited by abandonment and long idleness why should the nobles be treated with more favor than the priests? 67. All usurpations, not born of war, have been caused and supported by labor. All modern history proves this, from the end of the Roman Empire down to the present day. And as if to give a sort of legal sanction to these usurpations, the doctrine of labor, 
subversive of property, is professed at great length in the Roman law under the name of prescription. The man who cultivates, it has been said, makes the land his own, consequently, no more property. This was clearly seen by the old jurists, who have not failed to denounce this novelty. While on the other hand the young school hoots at the absurdity of the first occupant theory. Others have presented themselves, pretending to reconcile the two opinions by uniting them. They have failed, like all the just milieu of the world, and are laughed at for their eclecticism. At present, the alarm is in the camp of the old doctrine. From all sides pour in defenses of property, studies regarding property, theories of property, each one of which, giving the lie to the rest, inflicts a fresh wound upon property. Consider, indeed, the inextricable embarrassments, the contradictions, the absurdities, the incredible nonsense, in which the bold defenders of property so lightly involve themselves. I choose the eclectics, because, those killed, the others cannot survive. M. Troplong, jurist, passes for a philosopher in the eyes of the editors of Le Droit. I tell the gentlemen of Le Droit that, in the judgment of philosophers, M. Troplong is only an advocate, and I prove my assertion. M. Troplong is a defender of progress. The words of the Code, says he, are fruitful sap with which the classic works of the 18th century overflow. To wish to suppress them, is to violate the law of progress, and to forget that a science which moves is a science which grows. 68. Now, the only mutable and progressive portion of law, as we have already seen, is that which concerns property. If, then, you ask what reforms are to be introduced into the right of property? M. Troplong makes no reply, what progress is to be hoped for? No reply, what is to be the destiny of property in case of universal association? No reply. What is the absolute and what the contingent, what the true and what the false, in property? No reply. M. Troplong favors quiescence and in statu quo in regard to property. What could be more unphilosophical in a progressive philosopher? Nevertheless, M. Troplong has thought about these things. There are, he says, many weak points and antiquated ideas in the doctrines of modern authors concerning property, witness the works of M. M. Tullier and Durantun. The doctrine of M. Troplong promises, then, strong points, advanced and progressive ideas. Let us see, let us examine. Man, placed in the presence of matter, is conscious of a power over it, which has been given to him to satisfy the needs of his being. King of inanimate or unintelligent nature, he feels that he has a right to modify it, govern it, and fit it for his use. There it is, the subject of property, which is legitimate only when exercised over things, never when over persons. M. Troplong is so little of a philosopher, that he does not even know the import of the philosophical terms which he makes a show of using. He says of matter that it is the subject of property, he should have said the object. M. Troplong uses the language of the anatomists, who apply the term subject to the human matter used in their experiments. This error of our author is repeated farther on, liberty, which overcomes matter, the subject of property, etc. The subject of property is man, its object is matter. But even this is but a slight mortification, directly we shall have some crucifixions. Thus, according to the passage just quoted, it is in the conscience and personality of man that the principle of property must be sought. Is there anything new in this doctrine? Apparently it never has occurred to those who, since the days of Cicero and Aristotle, and earlier, have maintained that things belong to the first occupant, that occupation may be exercised by beings devoid of conscience and personality. The human personality, though it may be the principle or the subject of property, as matter is the object, is not the condition. Now, it is this condition which we most need to know. So far, M. Troplong tells us no more than his masters, and the figures with which he adorns his style add nothing to the old idea. Property, then, implies three terms, the subject, the object, and the condition. There is no difficulty in regard to the first two terms. As to the third, the condition of property down to this day, 
for the Greek as for the barbarian, has been that of first occupancy. What now would you have it, progressive doctor? When man lays hands for the first time upon an object without a master, he performs an act which, among individuals, is of the greatest importance. The thing thus seized and occupied participates, so to speak, in the personality of him who holds it. It becomes sacred, like himself. It is impossible to take it without doing violence to his liberty, or to remove it without rashly invading his person. Diogenes did but express this truth of intuition, when he said, Stand out of my light. Very good. But would the prince of cynics, the very personal and very haughty Diogenes, have had the right to charge another cynic, as rent for this same place in the sunshine, a bone for twenty-four hours of possession? It is that which constitutes the proprietor, it is that which you fail to justify. In reasoning from the human personality and individuality to the right of property, you unconsciously construct a syllogism in which the conclusion includes more than the premises, contrary to the rules laid down by Aristotle. The individuality of the human person proves individual possession, originally called proprietas, in opposition to collective possession, communio. It gives birth to the distinction between thine and mine, true signs of equality, not, by any means, of subordination. From equivocation to equivocation, says M. Michelet, 69, property would crawl to the end of the world. Man could not limit it, were not he himself its limit. Where they clash, there will be its frontier. In short, individuality of being destroys the hypothesis of communism. But it does not for that reason give birth to domain, that domain by virtue of which the holder of a thing exercises over the person who takes his place a right of prestation and suzerainty, that has always been identified with property itself. Further, that he whose legitimately acquired possession injures nobody cannot be non-suited without flagrant injustice, is a truth, not of intuition, as M. Troplong says, but of inward sensation, 70 which has nothing to do with property. M. Troplong admits, then, occupancy as a condition of property. In that, he is in accord with the Roman law, in accord with M.M. Tullier and Durantun. But in his opinion this condition is not the only one, and it is in this particular that his doctrine goes beyond theirs. But, however exclusive the right arising from sole occupancy, does it not become still more so, when man has molded matter by his labor? When he has deposited in it a portion of himself, recreating it by his industry, and setting upon it the seal of his intelligence and activity? Of all conquests, that is the most legitimate, for it is the price of labor. He who should deprive a man of the thing thus remodeled, thus humanized, would invade the man himself, and would inflict the deepest wounds upon his liberty. I pass over the very beautiful explanations in which M. Troplong, discussing labor and industry, displays the whole wealth of his eloquence. M. Troplong is not only a philosopher, he is an orator, an artist. He abounds with appeals to the conscience and the passions. I might make sad work of his rhetoric, should I undertake to dissect it, but I confine myself for the present to his philosophy. If M. Troplong had only known how to think and reflect, before abandoning the original fact of occupancy and plunging into the theory of labor, he would have asked himself, what is it to occupy? And he would have discovered that occupancy is only a generic term by which all modes of possession are expressed, seizure, station, imminence, habitation, cultivation, use, consumption, etc. That labor, consequently, is but one of a thousand forms of occupancy. He would have understood, finally, that the right of possession which is born of labor is governed by the same general laws as that which results from the simple seizure of things. What kind of a legist is he who declaims when he ought to reason, who continually mistakes his metaphors for legal axioms, and who does not so much as know how to obtain a universal by induction, and form a category? If labor is identical with occupancy, the only benefit which it secures to the laborer is the right of individual possession of the object of his labor. If it differs from occupancy, it gives birth to a right equal only to itself, that is, a right which begins, continues, and ends, with the labor of the occupant. It is for this reason, in the words of the law, that one cannot acquire a just title to a thing by labor alone.
he must also hold it for a year and a day, in order to be regarded as its possessor. And possess it twenty or thirty years, in order to become its proprietor. These preliminaries established, M. Troplong's whole structure falls of its own weight, and the inferences, which he attempts to draw, vanish. Property once acquired by occupation and labor, it naturally preserves itself, not only by the same means, but also by the refusal of the holder to abdicate. For from the very fact that it has risen to the height of a right, it is its nature to perpetuate itself and to last for an indefinite period. Rights, considered from an ideal point of view, are imperishable and eternal. And time, which affects only the contingent, can no more disturb them than it can injure God himself. It is astonishing that our author, in speaking of the ideal, time, and eternity, did not work into his sentence the divine wings of Plato, so fashionable today in philosophical works. With the exception of falsehood, I hate nonsense more than anything else in the world. Property once acquired. Good, if it is acquired, but, as it is not acquired, it cannot be preserved. Rights are eternal. Yes, in the sight of God, like the archetypal ideas of the Platonists. But, on the earth, rights exist only in the presence of a subject, an object, and a condition. Take away one of these three things, and rights no longer exist. Thus, individual possession ceases at the death of the subject, upon the destruction of the object, or in case of exchange or abandonment. Let us admit, however, with M. Troplong, that property is an absolute and eternal right, which cannot be destroyed save by the deed and at the will of the proprietor. What are the consequences which immediately follow from this position? To show the justice and utility of prescription, M. Troplong supposes the case of a bona fide possessor whom a proprietor, long since forgotten or even unknown, is attempting to eject from his possession. At the start, the error of the possessor was excusable but not irreparable. Pursuing its course and growing old by degrees, it has so completely clothed itself in the colors of truth, it has spoken so loudly the language of right, it has involved so many confiding interests. That it fairly may be asked whether it would not cause greater confusion to go back to the reality than to sanction the fictions which it, an error, without doubt, has sown on its way. Well, yes, it must be confessed, without hesitation, that the remedy would prove worse than the disease, and that its application would lead to the most outrageous injustice. How long since utility became a principle of law? When the Athenians, by the advice of Aristides, rejected a proposition eminently advantageous to their republic, but also utterly unjust, they showed finer moral perception and greater clearness of intellect than M. Troplong. Property is an eternal right, independent of time, indestructible except by the act and at the will of the proprietor, and here this right is taken from the proprietor, and on what ground? Good God! On the ground of absence. Is it not true that legists are governed by caprice in giving and taking away rights? When it pleases these gentlemen, idleness, unworthiness, or absence can invalidate a right which, under quite similar circumstances, labor, residence, and virtue are inadequate to obtain. Do not be astonished that legists reject the absolute. Their good pleasure is law, and their disordered imaginations are the real cause of the evolutions in jurisprudence. If the nominal proprietor should plead ignorance, his claim would be none the more valid. Indeed, his ignorance might arise from inexcusable carelessness, etc. What? In order to legitimate dispossession through prescription, you suppose faults in the proprietor. You blame his absence, which may have been involuntary. His neglect, not knowing what caused it, his carelessness, a gratuitous supposition of your own. It is absurd. One very simple observation suffices to annihilate this theory. Society, which, they tell us, makes an exception in the interest of order in favor of the possessor as against the old proprietor, owes the latter an indemnity. Since the privilege of prescription is nothing but expropriation for the sake of public utility. But here is something stronger. In society a place cannot remain vacant with impunity. A new man arises in place of the old one who disappears or goes away, he brings here his existence, becomes entirely absorbed, 
and devotes himself to this post which he finds abandoned. Shall the deserter, then, dispute the honor of the victory with the soldier who fights with the sweat standing on his brow, and bears the burden of the day, in behalf of a cause which he deems just? When the tongue of an advocate once gets in motion, who can tell where it will stop? M. Troplong admits and justifies usurpation in case of the absence of the proprietor, and on a mere presumption of his carelessness. But when the neglect is authenticated, when the abandonment is solemnly and voluntarily set forth in a contract in the presence of a magistrate, when the proprietor dares to say, I cease to labor, but I still claim a share of the product, then the absentee's right of property is protected, the usurpation of the possessor would be criminal, farm rent is the reward of idleness. Where is, I do not say the consistency, but, the honesty of this law.